Welcome, everyone. That was kind of a raucous beginning to a, a forum on poverty and homelessness, so thank you, candidates. Uh, I am Mary Agnes Welch. I am a, uh, a, a pollster, a researcher with Probe Research in Winnipeg, and I'm your moderator tonight. Um, and so welcome all of you. Thank you so much for coming on a day when you might have had some more fun things to do because of a certain legal substance today. This is a great turnout on a, you know, <laughs> on a, uh, yeah, on a, an interesting day. Um, so this is the second year, I think, that I've been asked to host uh, this forum on poverty and homelessness. And uh, I think it's, frankly, I genuinely think it's the most important issue we face in this city. And it's also an issue that we are only making tiny micro uh, uh, changes to, tiny little improvements to our significant issue of, of uh, poverty. Um, and some of these changes, really, some of this good work is due in part to the people in this room. Many of you work in the sector. Many of you are people who live in poverty yourselves and are working on this issue. Um, as are the organizers uh, of, this, of this forum. Um, and those organizers are the Social Planning Council of Winnipeg, Winnipeg Harvest, Make Poverty History Manitoba, and the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. And we also know that uh, an election campaign is a really busy time, and these candidates have given a lot of their time to forums like this, and it's, this is an intense final week, and so we really appreciate them joining us tonight to talk about this. Uh, it's, 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 it's much appreciated. I also want to acknowledge that this very important discussion is taking place on the original lands of the Anishinaabeg, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. Yeah. Um, we, we respect uh, the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Um, so with that, I'm going to tell you quickly a bit about the plan for the evening, very quickly, and a bit about the rules that all of these candidates have agreed to. We're going to start uh, the evening off with uh, opening statements from each of the candidates. Um, and then I have two questions, one of which involves a video uh, for the candidates. They'll each get the same amount of time to answer uh, each of these questions. They've had a peek at these questions in advance, um, so hopefully we'll get some very fulsome uh, uh, responses to this really, re these really important issues. Then we're going to take a short 10-minute-ish break. Um, and during that break, I want you folks to think about your questions, because right after that, we'll have a chance for you to ask your questions either by, by mic or by writing them on a piece of paper if you're not really in love with the idea of getting up in front of a room full of people. So we'll have folks walking around with a little piece of paper for you um, to ask your, your question. Um, uh, we will ask you, when you speak, uh, to ask your question to keep it to a minute. Um, I'm going to be a stickler for the time limits, um, certainly with the candidates, but also a little bit with you folks, because we want to get in as many questions and we have a lot to cover uh, in a short period of time. Um, uh, we are live streaming this. It's actually being live streamed right now uh, on Shaw TV. Um, and we'd also love it if you tweeted about uh, what you hear tonight, uh, what you like, what you don't like, interesting ideas that come out. Um, and if you tweet, uh, please use the hashtag WPG18. Winnipeg 18, WPG 18, or hashtag no poverty, K-N-O-W, no poverty. Uh, okay, here's the rules. This is the really important part, gents. Um, we've drawn lots to see who speaks in what order, and we've kind of got the folks lined up uh, at the table there in the order in which they'll speak, and we'll stagger um, who starts. So the very first question, Mr. Hyatt will start, and then we'll kind of move on from there. Um, oops. Uh, We've, again, we've given each candidate a set amount of time to answer each, each question, and I'll remind them, re remind them of this time. We've got Jennifer, the timekeeper, right here. She's like the most important person in this room, basically. Yes, give it up for Jennifer. So all, if all of you candidates could just keep your eye on her, she'll give you the one minute, 30 seconds. Yeah, perfect, Jennifer. She'll give you the 30 second countdown. Watch for her out of the corner of your eye. Um, if candidates don't use their full time, uh, we will love them a little more, and I will give them a big hug at the end. So feel free to keep it, you know, to edit a little bit. Keep it, uh, uh, keep it, uh, keep it short. Um, but if you do go over your time, I will be the hammer. I will step in. I will cut you off if you're not uh, obeying Jennifer. And the ultimate hammer I have is to uh, make a signal to Evan, our sound guy, and cut the mic. So, so, so don't make me be mean, because I will be mean. I will do it. 
Um, similarly, I will step in if a candidate is straying too far from the topic. We really want to keep this focused on poverty, homelessness, uh, low income issues. And if we're going off on some crazy tangent, I will step in. Uh, so, so pardon the interruption in advance, but I, I, I will not hesitate. Um, we want this to be a, a real debate. We want it to be lively. We want to share information, but we also want to keep it as focused as we can. That's it. That is the long preamble. So I want to start now. I've covered everything, guys. I think I have. Yeah. I'm going to open it up now to our opening statements. You each have three, two minutes. Sorry, two minutes. Um, and I want to start with Mr. Hyatt. You're up first. You can sit right there. That's okay. You can oh, just... Thanks. <laughs> Uh, my name is Umar, my last name is Hyde. Uh, this topic is very close to my heart. The reason is the guy who's standing in front of you right now, he lives in poverty, first 24 years of his life. How? Oh, no, no, Mr. Hyatt, wait, to get you on the show, we need you on there. Yeah. I do work with the Winnipeg Harvest as a volunteer. And how we can, I can sum up into that question, first of all, how we can reduce poverty, homelessness, and affordable housing in Winnipeg? Simple, if you can ask from an incumbent, he's gonna say uh, he did amazing job, but look at the city of Winnipeg official uh, paper. City of Winnipeg has no money. And everyone right now promising to adjust, my incumbent promised 2.33% increase property taxes. And rest of all candidates, they did promise even freeze property taxes. And even one of the candidates did promise 1.16%. Trust me, Winnipeggers, we can't grow. We do, we do need money. So I'm going to tell you what the solution is. Solution is I'm going to be sell Winnipeggers your golf courses. Three right away, 49% stakes. And three, when it's going to be end lease 2020 and 21. And I'm making revenue $50 million. Also, I'm cutting funding from Winnipeg Art Gallery, $5 million a year. So I'm going to save $20 million from Winnipeg Art Gallery. I'm also going to be save Winnipeg Labor Force for $6 million, $24 million in four years. Anyway, for this $100 million, I'm going to be used for low income bus pass. That city of Winnipeg's priority. People, they do need work. And last four years, my incumbent even did promise he's going to be happen low income bus pass in Winnipeg, but it didn't happen. It cost $10 million. The people who make less than $30,000 in Winnipeg, it cost taxpayers $10 million. We do need money. Each homeless cost taxpayers $30,000 a year. We do need to be faced over social issues. We can't grow as a society. So simple solution is affordable housing. If we say something, I'm going to do it, you need money. Where are you going to get the money? So simple solution is we have to be sacrificed. No one is talking about cutting funding. I know, trust me, as soon as I said, I'm going to be cut Winnipeg Art Gallery, I was blasted on social media. And I said, I'm going to be sell 49% of your golf courses six golf courses takes within four years, I was blast. Because problem is this, everyone talking about promising and they're not talking about solutions. Solutions is we do need money. City of Winnipeg has $1.7 billion debt and $89 million deficit. So sorry, Thank you. my time is up. Thank that you. was perfect. Radio. Good, good ending. Thank you, Mr. Hyatt. Mr. Woodstock, over to you. I want to thank you guys for joining me again here. As a guy who has um, lobbied the city for years on a number of initiatives, I was one of those who went out on my own time and dime. I drove a bus for transit with my wife for nine years. I have my own business today. We are, are the authorized dealer of ADT. We have an A plus rating with the Better Business Bureau because we believe in service. I lobbied the city hall on three different times, never been elected. Those big blue bins you see, you can see the presentation online. I went there when the city had decided to roll out those recycling tote. I made a very good presentation to council, thanks to Councillor Harvey Smith. We didn't see eye to eye politically. It was one of those few individuals who were able to embrace a good idea. That's what the city needs. How do we grow our tax base? 
and help the people. We have to find a way to get more people here so that less of us will share the taxes. If we all have the same number of individuals here instead of growing the tax base, what's going to happen is that I, no, no matter who get in, they will have to raise your taxes. I had said from day one I want to end homelessness because there are seven cities in Canada to end homelessness. Homes for Heroes Foundation came to this city. They're looking for ways and means to take home, homeless people off the street and provide a home for them, which will actually be a savings of $1.5 million annually. Our incumbent here and the city department refused them. and They weren't asking for money. We need some hardcore people person sitting at the ledges, as well as we need some hardcore people person sitting at the civic, civic level. And these are people who understand, not just talk. Talk is cheap, action is everything. The first set of electric buses that was built in the city was because of my efforts with Jim Randall. Why is all of this important to you? A lot of folks have said, Don, why should I vote for you? It's simple. Who else have a plan? Who else have a vision? Who have demonstrated that they have a vision? I've asked you before to come on me. Short TV is here, and I see from the days when we lobby everybody to get the recycling answer initiative, as well as the plastic bag day, as well as the reusable bags. Now I see all Dollarama have reusable bags. Six years later, and we need to think outside the box. Four years ago, I said that we, need, we are in the center of Canada. Marijuana is going to be legal. We need to take advantage of this. Chuck Davison and Dave Angus at the Winnipeg um, um, Art, uh, you know, the Winnipeg Cafe, they laughed at me. No, they're not laughing today, are they? Vision, leadership, that's what I bring to the table. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks, Mr. Woodstock. <laughs> Mr. Ackerman. Testing one, two. Hi, uh, my name's Ed Ackerman. I'm a filmmaker. I'm homeless, actually homeless. I slept in these clothes last night. These are rental clothes. Um, we are a rock and roll band, and it's, uh, we've gone on many different places on our tour, and it's, let me tell you on behalf of everyone, it's really great to be back in Winnipeg. We're back on the stage a second time. This was the Jewish Business Council show, and now we're back for the Homeless Show. It's a really nice round trip. Um, I have an objection. You mentioned Treaty 1, uh, respecting that. I don't think we should respect Treaty 1. I think we should follow it. I got a copy of it here, I went to the library, and I find that homelessness started in Manitoba. This is Treaty 1. It's only two and a half pages with a little amendment here that make it four pages. Uh, Treaty 1 is structurally where homelessness started. This is 1871, and I know this is a municipal election, but I propose that we all read it, read Treaty 1. It's my opinion, it's a bad deal. Uh, we need to fix it. And a few people got together and, and wrote it up of a land surrender. Um, we all, I mean, all of us in Manitoba can open this up, go through it, and make it right for everyone. Now, this is about homelessness, and unfortunately, golf courses were mentioned. There is some problem historically in our country between golf courses and treaty territory. One thing that hasn't been, like this is a round trip now, so we're back in Winnipeg. One thing we haven't talked about much, we haven't spread out uh, among everyone, is the annual report of the city of Winnipeg um, from what money was actually spent last year and how it was divided up. It's fairly thick, it's fairly complicated, but I looked in that, one minute left, awesome. Within that, the city of Winnipeg, from what I see, spends $53 million on interest. I propose that we make our own bank. We make a city bank and we borrow money from ourselves. Now there's two cities that are doing this right now. Toronto is looking into it and Los Angeles is having a real referendum on having their own Los Angeles City Bank and that vote is November 6th. We need to do that kind of stuff here to fix structural problems about homelessness. And 30 seconds can go in the pot. You can uh, sell it on eBay. All right. Thank you. Mr. Dyack? 
Yeah, my name is uh, Tim Dyack. This is our third time here. Um, we had the, uh, but that's okay. We've had a lot of them and we get tired, I get that. Yeah. I've uh, currently working in Point Douglas, which is listed as one of the poorest postal codes in Canada. This is one of the reasons that I pursued uh, this office. I haven't come out with a quarter million dollar campaign and I am not an incumbent who is holding the position now. I'm just a uh, guy who's seen the novelty of good intentions worn off. I have firsthand watched children in states that it's not fair. So child poverty is really where the focus of a municipal government can have the greatest impact. Because as they get older, it becomes a lot more expensive and more difficult. Not to say we should stop trying, but the focus needs to be on children. So I get coached by a bunch of people to say that's not in your lane. You know, that's a provincial responsibility. I kind of have trouble with that because if I can touch a child that has no hope and no chance, can't learn in school, well, we can fix that. So I impress upon uh, the William White breakfast program is deficient. They try, but they're not properly funded and the nutrition level of what they get is, it checks a box, I get it, but we need to bring that up to a good breakfast, possibly a lunch, probably a dinner plan. We need to have after school activities. We need a structured, safe place for children to grow up with adults that form a good role model. I could go on, but poverty is real in our city. And it's not just a number, and it's not something that's out of sight, out of mind for me. I deal with it every day when I'm at work. I gotta admire the people that volunteer and go down and do it on their time off, or the people that have committed themselves to that one problem. Because I can see that if you invest yourself in that problem. It will eat you up. I don't need another minute to be doom and gloom, I will tell you. Um, I really do hope for progress, and that would be my intent if uh, I'm at the helm, to include a real measure so that we can start to chart progress when we start dealing with the issue of poverty. And uh, my numbers are harsh. I look at recidivism rate for, uh, for incarceration and why that occurs. Um, Truancy, I'd like to see the city get involved, make sure the kids stay in school. The health system, indication of uh, poverty because they're more inclined to be there. But most of all, I'd like to see hope, but we can't measure that. But I'd like to see an end to poverty and an end to homelessness. I think that's achievable in our city, and I see it firsthand. Doubters, I uh, would love to take you for a field trip. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tim. Appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Bowman? Super. Uh, well, firstly, I, I too want to just begin by acknowledging we're on Treaty 1 land in the traditional homeland of the Métis, and the water that we drink, except for this bottled water, is from Shoal Lake. Um, I also want to just thank the organizers for bringing us here together uh, tonight to talk about an uh, incredibly important topic uh, affecting our community, and, uh, and far too many people in our community. Uh, I also want to applaud each of the candidates who thought this has value and this is an important enough issue that they showed up. And so I want to compliment each of the candidates who I know um, care about these issues um, and are here to, uh, to, to deal with it uh, as best we each can in our own way. Um, one of uh, the, the overall vision and theme of, of my, uh, my term and uh, the commitment that I'm making should I be reelected is to continue building Winnipeg for the future and to do it in a way in which uh, we don't leave anyone behind. Uh, I've announced my uh, poverty reduction uh, plans uh, as well as a commitment to continue some of the work on end homelessness. Uh, yesterday you can visit it at bowmanforwinnipeg.ca uh, more fully. Um, but there's a couple, couple uh, points I want to make in terms of substantive things that we've been working on. One of the things I learned um, uh, when I was uh, fortunate enough to be elected in 2014 is you can't always choose the issues that uh, confront a mayor and you need to be able to respond as best you can and do it in a way that tries to bring out the best in the people around you and in the community. Um, campaigns uh, of division are, are not ones that I think bring out the best. Nobody here has a monopoly on good ideas and that's where a lot of the organizations that have brought us here together today have been valuable in my work and the work of many members of council and of course the city. Um, some of the things that we've worked on just by bringing people together of course is the plan to end homelessness. Um, this is being run by End Homelessness Winnipeg. 
Um, uh, Tim's right, uh, some of these issues aren't strictly speaking in municipal jurisdiction, in, including that, uh, but there's a role for us to play in a lot of these topics. And so I was proud to uh, bring that to council, get unanimous consent and uh, back it up with multi-year funding for End Homelessness Winnipeg, which I've committed to continuing uh, that support. Uh, the Winnipeg Promise is something you may not have heard about, but I would encourage you to learn more about. And that's looking at the root causes of poverty. And, and uh, one of the ways in which we can mitigate poverty is by uh, doing what we can to break down barriers in our community uh, to the Canada Learning Bond. Uh, since I announced the Winnipeg Promise and we started working with a, a very large group of frontline um, uh, organizations in Winnipeg, uh, there have been uh, thousands of children uh, that have signed up for the Canada Learning Bond. And the last thing I'll mention is just the Food Council. Uh, that's something I'm really proud and grateful of uh, those people in the room that supported that. Councillor Brian Mays uh, has been a real champion for that uh, as well, and I want to give him credit. And I'm looking forward to talking about a number of other issues uh, tonight. Thanks very much. Merci. Merci. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Wilson, welcome. Good to see you again. Thank you very Over much, Mary. Yeah, I am really happy to be here. I uh, have a... There's a wonderful thing about this room. This room, I know this room because I've spent years listening to CBC and the Eckhart Gramate Hall having so many classical performances in here. That goes back to the time when Aldo first started working at the Free. The, the, the cool thing about this third forum here is that we've all grown a little bit from the first forum where I first met Brian. And Brian, you've done a really good job for just about finishing four years of your first term. I want to say that. You've tried real hard. Okay. <laughs> Plan to end homelessness. Food in mouth is a band-aid on a bullet hole. If we're feeding people and we think that we're going to fix things by feeding people, we're not addressing the issue. Having a home is the key. You go from dependency to self-sufficiency. If you give someone a home and you ask them to work with you on becoming better, work to clean up, work to deal with the behavior issues that sort of put you out there in the street. In the long run, it's less expensive. Less people on the street. Less people lined up at the hospitals. Less police issues so that they can go on to other issues. What are we talking about? We're talking about the issue and we're talking about focusing on homelessness. Because when you put somebody in a stable environment, you can start addressing the issues. Now, my name's Doug Wilson. I'm the former mayor of Morden, Manitoba. Morden is Canada's newest city. Morden has had problems. Morden has a low income, average income. People work really hard for their money down there, but they have active living. They have a good police force well run. They have a public works that gets the roads plowed very quickly and people pay attention when public works goes out on the roads because we have to get along to get anything done. Take Morden and add two zeros to any line item on the budget. Add two zeros. It's still the same line item. It's still the same responsibility. It's the management and the direction of a city that matters, and I want to lead you for the next four years. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. That was a, a good start. Um, so now I've got my first question for you, and you're each going to have uh, three minutes uh, to answer. And Mr. Woodstock, you're going to go first because we're staggering it uh, as we go, so get ready. So here's the question. Um, Winnipeg Harvest has seen a 58% increase in food bank use over the last decade. In Winnipeg alone, more than 9,500 children use food banks every month. The cost of living for all Winnipeggers is on the rise, with individuals and families not having enough in their budget for basic needs like food, housing, and recreational activities. If elected mayor, how would you help support people living with a limited budget? Mr. Woodstock. Thank you. 
When elected mayor, I will support people that live in a limited budget. The city of Winnipeg will support this by offering immediately low fares, two bucks, and work its way down to a dollar. No more corporate welfare. We saw what happened with Chitman and Bowman and $1,500 worth of donation get Chitman $28 million. I wonder if I could do the same. Millionaires who don't need the money shouldn't be getting any money from the city. We should be spending this money in affordable low-income housing and a subsidy program. Marijuana is here. We didn't take a jump, a leap of faith and look at this and see how best we can create jobs in the city. Instead, we leave fear and dogma to what, you know, to come of it. Recreational facilities for me is important. $250 million annually spending in the core neighborhoods, helping families with household income of $120,000 or less. Registration, fees, equipment. My wife and I have been hosting a free football clinic in the West End for the last six years. We see what, you know, how important this is. Sports capital, not crime capital. I've said it from day one. Come with me on this journey, folks. I'd rather see your kids on the street doing nothing. Do you rather see kids on the street doing nothing or in gangs or on the field of play? My suggestion is let's have them on the field of play because if they develop their brain around sports, they'll do much better. Omega Garden, last the federal election, I was the guy on the stage with Pat Martin, and asked him some very important question about mental health. Instead, he called me names. So I've taken some blows for you. Give me your vote this time. Hydroponic, the whole business of um, um, growing our own food is also important. Glean the fields. I have gone to those fields, and I've got my hands dirty because I'm a farm boy from Jamaica. And so is my wife. She's not from Jamaica, but she's not afraid to put her hand in dirt. We need to invest in a grand scale. And when I mention this 2015, I'm happy to tell you that Churchill now have its own indoor garden growing. It can be done. We need to feed our people. Good nutrition. No more slurpy capital. And for me, it's about spending money in the community. What the politicians won't tell you is something we all know. It's cheaper to put people in a home. The federal government spends $7.2 billion and homeless folks in Canada, if they spend $4 billion and put everybody in a home and provide services for them, it's cheaper. Why are we not building homes for people? Here's why. It's a sick, twisted mentality that some of us have, and what they're doing is trying to get your kids into gangs and in prison. Thanks, Don. We'll have to leave it there. Mr. Ackerman? Testing one, two. I'm going to be the most, r <clears throat> the roughest on uh, all of the homeless helping institutions, I think. I'm against actually so much of the structural helping of homeless people, um, industries that have been set up that continue a cycle of people lining up for food as if it's prison. I've eaten at Salom. Um, the food can be okay at times, it's appreciated. The problem is the jail-like lineup mentality of it and the uh, kind of the lack of freedom. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's like jail training. Um, I think there's a tremendous amount of wasted food in our society that it's industrial pro industrially produced and it gets to the end of the line, including Walmart, and then it has to go somewhere. Well, there's setups where structurally, instead of it going to the dump, it can go to different places like Harvest. Um, I hate shopping. Um, I've done this at Harvest. I've gone to Harvest, and in one day, I went through the dumpster behind Harvest and found lots of cans of food. In fact, in one day, I got enough food for seven months. Uh, I had freedom from that. If you have food, you need a place to put it, even if it's in cans. These are all dented cans, but this is kind of structurally something that's a problem that's not really... It's helping people along the way, but it's actually solving production of food, um, overproduction problems, and dealing with 
wastage. Um, the good thing about having seven months worth of food in one place is that you can do other things in your life. You don't have to worry. And if you're not uh, happy about eating canned food, well, you can do something else. The problem with that is in six months, I got a cavity from eating the food. The food itself is actually not that good. It's uh, preserved. So structurally, we need to work out uh, ways that people can solve problems themselves and then can get back to the cause of hopelessness, and that's Treaty 1. Because with this, what I'm proposing here, if you read it, everyone gets um, $5 once a year in July. In 1871, $5 you could live on. Um, if you take a $5 1871 uh, bill, an American one, you, uh, what it's worth right now is $24,000. That's what the deal was about. It wasn't about a piece of paper. It's about you can live on this for a year. So if we open up Treaty 1, we work it out. We've got a lot of resources. It's a big province. We can figure it out. Then we can get rid of welfare. We can get rid of people being on uh, wards of the state. And that's actually a problem. Thanks, Ed. Perfect timing. Mr. Mr. Dyack. Uh, well, you gave us the questions up front, which was nice, but it meant that I took the liberty of writing it down. Usually I like to answer these from the heart. So if it sounds like it's scripted, I scripted it, but it is still from the heart. So I try to imagine a city where there is no one living in poverty. I work in the poorest postal codes in Canada. I've said that. I look at the issue in two distinct ways, however, because uh, we know we have a wide range of opinions on this issue. The first is through a compassionate eye. The children living in fear, hunger, and anger is just wrong. They should not bear the burden of all the factors that made them live that way. I have proposed that the city take an active role in providing a high quality nutritious breakfast program and look at a lunch and dinner program if required. I know that kids need a safe place to learn and play with other kids, with adults that provide a positive role model. Winnipeg schools can provide that need. It's the right thing to do, and those who feel I may be soft, I invite them to come for a tour. The flip side of this is the second way to look at it is through the cold eye of cost, which we tend to talk a lot about in municipal politics. And that as we feed them now, or we feed them in prison, failing to show that we care about these kids will breed another generation of killers, drug traffickers, robbers, and thieves. I know this. The cost to police, prosecute, and incarcerate is way too high. If a dollar is spent up front to show that we care, it'll be worth 20 bucks on the back end if we show that we don't. You don't have to care at all. It's just a good business plan for the city of Winnipeg. So maybe there's someone who would challenge this, and uh, I refer to a Dr. Barb McDonald. She did a peer-reviewed study on the effects of hunger and graduation. It supports what I've stated here. I went to school with Barb. She graduated and got a doctorate. I graduated and got to walk the beat in the winter. So there's no guarantees, but uh, I sit here before you with all that experience and I can tell you that is the key. We need to feed our children. We need to feed everybody's children. And we have to make sure they get an education. I reverse engineer everything that goes sideways, because that's what we do. I go to failure all the time. Three decades of going to failure. All the good intentions and all the fancy rhetoric, the novelty of that wore off a long time ago. We need hard facts, and we need people motivated. I know there's a bunch of people here that do good work, and uh, if I'm the mayor, that work will be amplified. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Okay. Mr. Bowman. Um, you're right. Uh, Tim's right. Uh, getting the answer or the, the questions in advance uh, means you, you you put a lot of content in, so uh, it's a bit of a challenge actually. Um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, so let, let's start with the question. The question was very simple. It was how would you support people living with a limited budget? So I'm gonna I'm gonna try to really focus on on answering uh, that question. Um, in, in the announcement that I made yesterday, again, you can visit it in full at BowmanForWinnipeg.ca. Um, what I did is I, I recommitted to uh, a, a number of initiatives which uh, help address uh, this question. Uh, one is a, a commitment to a low-income bus pass. It's something that 
Uh, Councillor Cindy Gilroy has been a real champion for us. So same with Councillor Jenny Gervasi at Council. And it's one that uh, I, I'd previously provided support for, but one that I made a, a commitment during this campaign to, uh, to continue to uh, support going forward. The other is a creation of a newcomer, uh, a newcomer welcome and inclusion policy. Uh, this was part of uh, the human rights announcement that I made earlier in the campaign. And it's one really um, focused on making sure that as we welcome increasingly new Canadians to, to Winnipeg, we want to make sure that city services are providing them with uh, a path to success and to try to make uh, their dollars stretch a lot further. Um, I want to continue to invest uh, the $1.25 million in support for our Indigenous Youth Strategy. This is Oshki Anishinaabe Naganiwak. Um, and it's a great program, and it's one uh, worthy of a continued support. Uh, the fee subsidy program, which provides access to uh, recreational opportunities, um, um, regardless of family income, is incredibly important, and I've, I've reaffirmed my support for that. And then also the introduction of more affordable housing. Um, one of the opportunities with the market lands is, is the opportunity to really inject uh, a sizable uh, number of affordable housing units uh, right in the heart of our city. It's a transformative opportunity with the PSB building and that's one where I'd like to see uh, affordable housing and I expect we will as a result of the, the collaboration with uh, Centre Venture uh, and the community. Um, the other thing that we need to look at uh, with a increasingly critical lens is Winnipeg Transit. Uh, we're doing an operational review right now, um, not only a low income bus pass but we need to make sure that we're providing uh, increases to the transit uh, budget as a result of the provincial decision unilaterally to end the 50-50 transit cost sharing initiative. And that's something that uh, we took a $10 million hit for uh, over the last year and uh, resulted in some very, very difficult uh, decisions. Um, much of these uh, issues also just start with the lens of making sure you're respecting tax dollars. You're looking at the money that's coming into City Hall and you're scrutinizing it through a lens uh, of poverty. and. Um, and that's why uh, Executive Policy Committee has instructed uh, the public service to research uh, all of our poverty mitigation measures right now, report back by the end of the year on what it is we're doing and how we can do a better job. And I got the stop sign, so I'm going to stop now. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Bowman. Mr. Wilson. We have an interesting situation where we have this style of, of uh, of uh, of missions and of, of of all sorts of different facilities, trying to work towards the same goal and overlapping, yet being in silos, so they do not connect. And and this is a this is a drain on our resources. It it means duplication. It means ineffectuality. It means you can't really scope out what's going on because the information doesn't pass between the silos either. So I've used the term silo effect and I'm using it in this situation because there are many, many people that are seriously interested in dealing with this problem. And no matter how many committees or councils or plans we have, if we don't deal with the silo effect, we're not going to get our a grip on this. So we're going to need a leader that's going to be able to talk to all the different powers that be. And it's a very delicate process and it requires a lot of trust. Now the reason I'm saying this is because we know, the science proves that housing does make a difference. I, I think if you are watching uh, the homeless uh, report that came out last week, if you've had any of the information of that over the news, you've seen that number three on that is a job of the needs, housing, stable uh, situation, and, and some care, some immediate care for those that are, have mental distress. This is another thing that's been lacking in our province since 1998. When we take all this together and we say, well, then this is a really big project, well, let's look at Steinbeck. Steinbeck has El Dad and it's strong and well. And the concept of internally displaced people can be broken down in this city so we can actually deal with these issues. We do have many people that come from other places in the province. This is well known. It is 
out of work people who lack skills. They're capable, but they don't have, they're not yet trained for a job. We can deal with those people. But then we have people that have been asked to leave other places and they wind up on our streets. And those are the people that scare us. Those are the ones that we see on the street and they're the ones that are causing us to make poverty the number one issue in this election. I want you to know that to deal with this, we want to work with the province on the basic income Manitoba, which means that we raise all the boats. We float all the boats. Everybody gets a chance, all the way up to middle class. And middle class is suffering in this. I'm stopping now. <laughs> Perfect. Well, we'll come back to you. You've got more time uh, later on. Thanks, Doug. Last but not least, Mr. Hyatt. Debbie, this is the time I'm right now telling you my passion. I met you seven months ago. Manitobans going to be make poverty uh, history in Winnipeg. How? I sat down six months in Winnipeg, all homeless people, and I learned politics from them. They're one of the finest people I met in my life. One of the homeless people, he has two PhD degrees. Please let me clarify them all first, because I have a very short time. One of the homeless people, he has two PhD degrees. Another homeless people, he is the big MC right now in the radio channel. When I sat down with them and I learned how as a mayor you can see a person if Calgary can finish uh, reducing uh, homeless poverty and so many issues, why not Winnipeg? They gave me a solution. They said, Omar, you know what the solution is? Hire more outreach workers. They can go talk to uh, people who are on the streets. My incumbent said, I'm going to give them a jobs. Do you believe us people on the street right now, they are able to go to start a job right away at the second day? I'm asking from you, Winnipeggers, do you believe people are homeless, they can go to start a work? They are not mentally able to go to start a work. We need issue, trust me, go to see my all everything. Mental health is the biggest challenge for our Winnipeg. Now I can come to the topic right now. What topic is? EIA. How many people they do believe they can live $650? Will you please raise the hand? That's the issue we have to be addressed right now. $650, which is Siloam Mission takes four to four fifty for accommodation, two hundred for their food. And I went to all trust me, Siloam Mission and everywhere talk to them. They couldn't even find the work. You know why? Simple question. They do not have a low income bus pass. It's not a big rocket science, which is going to be happen in Winnipeg. My incumbent is promising last 10 years, but it's not gonna happen. I'm telling you the truth because you don't know he's going to increase his 2.33% property taxes. Where's the money comes from? I know I have a huge criticism to through cutting, but I'm giving you a plan. Second thing, right now, for homelessness. We have a huge land in Winnipeg. Why not we talk to Habitat for Humanity? Come step forward. We can give you a land free to make it happen Winnipeg right now for accessible homes. Look at here. Please don't laugh. Give me a sec. Uh, simple as that. L listen right now. In Winnipeg, we're giving a land to private developers for dollar one. But we did not do anything for homeless people. Why? Because I want to save my time. Oh. That, a, a round of applause is a good, a good point to, to end on. Uh, thanks, Mr. Hyatt. Really appreciate it. Um, okay, so before we get to the video question, I just want to say we're doing great. We're doing great for time. This is a substantive, nerdy, policy-focused discussion, and I'm, I'm really impressed. So thank you all for, for playing along with the rules. And I, yeah, this is great. Okay, um, so before we get to the video, I just want to point out Debbie. I think Debbie is in the audience here. A fellow ginger right up there. She's apparently in this video that you're about to see that will be the kind of the preface for our next uh, question to the candidates. Um, so please take a look at the video. This Winnipeg election help us make poverty reduction a priority. Over a hundred community groups back 50 evidence-based ideas to improve the lives of people struggling to make ends meet. We are calling on all candidates for mayor and council to be leaders in poverty reduction. Why? 
Up to 107,000 Winnipeggers live below the poverty line. Poverty is a trap people can't escape. Winnipeg is a leader in volunteerism and charitable donations, but we need a plan. It would only take 1% of GDP to lift all Manitobans above the poverty line. Poverty means more spent on police and emergency services. Preventing poverty saves lives and money. We've got to do better and we can. Let's make poverty history. This Winnipeg election join us to call on all candidates to be leaders in poverty reduction in our city. Our plan asks mayor and council to work with community to develop a Winnipeg poverty reduction strategy with targets and timelines. Go to winnipegwithoutpoverty.ca to learn more and get involved. On October 24th, vote for those who will make ending poverty a priority in Winnipeg. All right, uh, thanks, that was great. Okay, so now the question that emerges from, uh, from this spot is, um, while there are limits uh, to what municipalities can do to lower the poverty rate, we've talked a bit about that tonight, we want to see the City of Winnipeg set goals and work towards these goals within a specific time frame. If elected mayor, how would you be a champion for a Winnipeg without poverty and commit to leading the development of a comprehensive poverty reduction plan for Winnipeg with progress indicators, targets, and timelines? And I think, Mr. Ackerman, you are first. And you have uh, three minutes, the same three minutes. Um, testing one, two. I'll work backwards, starting from this. Um, what we can do as a municipality is we can change structurally what happens. For example, make tiny, tiny vendor business licenses free. The people that are trying to do the smallest things don't put some kind of business vending license fee on them. For example, if you, people go to Salome Mission or to Agape Table, it's possible to get food. You can actually live on zero. Um, you, you can actually get enough to eat at those places. They're that good, they're that positive, and Agape Table has uh, kind of bulk food, so there, there's extra, usually produce, that has to be gotten rid of. The problem is, at Salon Mission, you have to pay if you're going to sleep overnight. I've never slept overnight there, but it's about 11 bucks, I think. So you've got a structural thing that... Salome Mission isn't free. There's people that have to panhandle to stay there overnight, as far as I know. So Salom Mission is free to stay there? I, okay. Um, the people that I talk to on the street um, panhandle so that they have a place to sleep. Anyway, regarding that, um, you've got some structural problems there that push people out to panhandle so they have a place to sleep. I'm suggesting that there be some kind of small, tiny business uh, license available for people that are selling small amounts of things, making up their own businesses, whatever they are, um, other than just some spare change. Um, I do have other ideas like free buses, and those will be paid for through property taxes with a parking component. And I have gone through the <coughs> annual report and I did mention I found $53 million in interest, and I also am suggesting that the police budget itself is reduced. The police budget is 27% of the budget of uh, all of Winnipeg. In Toronto, the police budget, I've been following that election, is what percent of the, does anyone know here? The Toronto police budget, what percent of the Toronto budget, city budget? 10%. I'm suggesting 10%. So there's money in there that we can juggle around, and I suggest that all of the homeless and poverty industry people look at the budget itself and see how we can work with what we've got. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tim. 
Okay, well, the short answer is yes. No, no. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I entered into this endeavor to become mayor because I can't ignore what I see in the direction that our city is headed. People in poverty are far more susceptible to violent crime. As a police officer, I can recall the utter shock I had this summer in 1988 when I saw the conditions people in my city lived in. You can ignore many things in order to complete your job. Being compassionate and feeling pity will destroy you emotionally. When you only get to see the extremes, you learn to cope. I wish there was the suggestion of some poverty measurement that we could apply in those early years. It is so very obvious to police officers. The fear, the pain, the hunger, and the harsh burden that we place on the multiple children born into that world. If I am mayor, there will be a direct link between social services and the general patrol officers that have to engage that world. Those social workers will need to be equipped to assess what the officers have reported. The structure and mechanism already exists within the Winnipeg Police Service. I would ensure that video is sent immediately and that the police would follow up on urgent assistance and these social assistant reports. And I would make sure that we bear good witness and we assist the province in their duties. And I paused long enough. That was, that was what I wanted to get across. And when, when I, I just should complete, that when people say that's not the police job, there's a portion of that, that's correct, but if I'm a witness to it and I'm standing close enough to touch a child that just so desperately needs help, I'm tired of politicians sidestepping responsibility. We will ensure a mechanism is in place so that that witness who is there, a professional, a person who is geared up, will make sure that the people in the province have to pay attention and that communication will build a bond and this is what we need to progress so that we can start to seek out active solution for the things that are suggested. I know a lot of people that, that you show up there, and I, uh, I can tell you that they're very tired. They want the good intentions, they don't want to discourage hope, but we have to start to engage a proper mechanism to make progress on this, especially if we want to end homelessness. There, now I'm done. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for that. Brian. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, firstly, the, uh, the plan to end homelessness, uh, just, just so Umar is aware, is, is, uh, is something that was developed before I was elected. It was uh, community driven. I know many people in this room helped support it. It was embraced by the United Way and, uh, and adopted by council and other levels of government. Um, it was when it was initiated a 10 year plan to end homelessness like they've done in other Canadian cities. And it absolutely is something that we can accomplish if we set our collective minds to it and we put the resources behind it. Uh, the question again was was pretty direct. It was a poverty reduction plan. Um, we've begun the building blocks uh, to do just that. And so, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Councillor Cindy Gilroy uh, led the initiative to uh, have Executive Policy Committee uh, direct the public service uh, to do a comprehensive review and report publicly uh, by uh, the end of the year on all of the poverty reduction measures and investments that the city, on your behalf, is currently making. Um, there hasn't been a real comprehensive review like this done before so that we could look at uh, where, where are we getting value for money? Are we getting the outcomes that we uh, expect and we need as a community? And so uh, that's the first step is let's get that assessment. Let's see where we're at and how we're spending uh, those existing dollars and look for ways in which we can do a better job. Uh, what I envision is that will be the building block for, for the plan and, and it's something that I would support. For a plan to be effective, however, we need to have other levels of government, notably the province of Manitoba, but also the federal government uh, to be partners because there's a role for every level of government to play. Uh, this provincial government uh, talks about being the most improved province in Manitoba, uh, as well as having measurable um, targets that can be, uh, that can be quantified. Uh, this is one of those things where that has to be uh, a factor, where we can set those targets, we can try to be the most improved province in Manitoba, and we want to work with them and we want to support them in achieving that. Um, that would be part of a plan that would be embraced, ideally, by all three levels of government. Uh, the level of government that is responsible for many of the things that we're talking about is the province, but again, there's a role for us to play. And one of those things is working with and uh, 
working collaboratively with many of the groups that were in that video. I, I know most of them. I've been working with most of them. That last person, I, I'm not sure about. I think he's uh, Ace Burpee. Uh, <laughs> but I, 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 what I want to do is I want to continue to work with everybody in the way that we're doing. And uh, the, the actions that we've, we've put into motion uh, are really going to highlight uh, and build upon the work of things like the Winnipeg Promise, the Anne Homelessness Winnipeg uh, Initiative, the fee subsidy, all of the initiatives that we're currently doing. But it hasn't been uh, reviewed in a comprehensive way that looks at, um, at those outcomes. And so uh, I think the city is doing some good things. I think we could do a better job. And I think we can also work with other levels of government to build exactly the kind of plan that that question uh, was asking if we would champion. And the answer for me would be yes. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before we get to you, Doug, uh, Mayor Bowman, just, just scooch that mic just a touch closer to you for next time. Okay. That's better. How's I think. that? Yeah. Yeah. I'll start over. No, 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 no. <laughs> Mr. Wilson. I do recall, recall the question at, uh, being about uh, we have the limits due to our position as a municipal government. We only collect 3% of the revenue that you pay in taxes. So we require a lot of relationships to be strong and productive between province, municipal, federal, municipal, and in provinces like this, maybe working in between the federal and the provincial because uh, I don't know why but they seem to have different ideas. So 2019, we need a massive recruitment of frontline workers. There's an excellent project called the Madison Building. It's, uh, it has 83 room. It has social workers. It has three square meals a day, a chef, certified chef. People improve in that place. There's an awful lot of people that are involved in making it happen. It would be really nice to see the Basic Income Manitoba look after people who do jobs for communities, for people who don't have help, who would otherwise be in poorer health. It's been proven, and it shows in, the, in Lauren Remillard's uh, bold Winnipeg strategy that if we bolster the people most in need in this province, we're going to see economic returns because of it. And let's not go and paint a picture that economic returns means that there's some sort of conspiracy. This city was built on small business. It's part of the policy. It's part of the plan. So again, I'll go back to the plan. 2019, massive investment in frontline workers. People get tired in social work. People get, they need to be, they need a more, we need more of them in the system. 2020, we want to look at replication of projects and it's part of breaking down the silo effects and building consensus, consensus within the different parties involved in dealing with poverty in our province. 2021, we are re-engaged with the province and the feds, and we are dealing with something that is their responsibility. However, they don't know how to do it. Really, what I think of provincial and federal governments is they know how to collect money, and they know how to make committees. 2022, we have reimagined the public transit system. And folks, it's free. And that's making everybody's lives better. And then we can deal with Portage and Maine. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Doug. OK, wrapping around, Mr. Hyatt. Thank you so much. You know what, I'm a little bit dry right now. I can tell you why. Because first 24 years of my life, I had no one-time good meal. I did not sleep so many times at my home because my son had no milk to, for himself. I had no even a chocolate or even Pepsi one time, first 24 years of my life. So whenever I met Debbie, I went to so many events. Why did I put even my name as a running? Because the thing is, poverty is not abuse. Poverty, it's not something we do not have a solution. All is leadership. As soon as I came to Canada, this beautiful city, this beautiful country, I work hard. I flip newspaper, blah, so many jobs, but I did not give up. Now I do investment in stock market, forex, and real estate. So anyway, I can come to the topic right now. Whenever someone talks about poverty, 
we can finish poverty. We can reduce. Uh, we can reduce poverty. How? Debbie said 1% of GDP. So you know how, how much over GDP right now in Winnipeg? Do you know anyone? $37 billion. It's okay. And is 1%? $347 million. We don't need taxpayers as much money. I can give you a simple plan. When I talk to people who are disabled and the people who are special needs, Trust me, no one hiring them. Go to see my social media. Always I'm crying. When I go to meet them outside of McDonald's and they talk about Steve Juba, some year 1956, I don't know because I'm new 10 years here in Winnipeg. But I can tell you solutions, guys. It's not about put something, roll stone on federal. It's not something, roll stone something for provincial. As a leader of a mayor, which thanks for you guys coming outside for your time to listening a leader of the city hall, 700 or 800,000 Winnipeggers going to be choose a guy of your mayor, he has a big role. How simple, I can give you a solution. First of all, please tell them corporations to increase their quota to uh, hire more disabled and special needs people. They do need work. And they are crying, trust me, no one hiring them. And they are neglecting them. Second solution, please think about, I'm always crying, promote businesses. As soon as I met with the Canadian Federation of Independent Business Bureau, my incumbent is very good for press releases. Right away they did tweet, he said that he's going to be reduced red tape. For God's sake, where he was last four years. If he knew that we have a red tape, why did not done reduce red tape in last four years? Simple, promote small businesses and bring foreign investment in Winnipeg and do at the earliest priority to make low income bus pass happen in Winnipeg. Even is a cost for a sell golf courses, even is a sell for even, I have a tons of ideas, but unfortunately I have no time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Umar. Don. Simple answer is yes. And this one, uh, takes me back a little bit because talk is cheap. I've been involved in a lot of these campaigns and I've listened to politicians make promises. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask you one question. If you hear promises time and time and time again, why do you still get excited when you hear promises? Why are we not letting people understand that you cannot promise us to keep doing something that you should have done. Action. You want action? Vote for me. Housing first strategy is something that we should have been done doing for years. From day one of this campaign, what have I done? I've said let's end homelessness. Why? There are seven cities in Canada looking to do it. Seven. So, it's, so we won't be the first to do it. So why are we still talking about what we are going to do? This should have been done already. It's cheaper. The federal government says it. The provincial government has the information. The city has that information. So why is it that it hasn't been done? Homes for Heroes Foundation came here. And what they've been doing across Canada, they've been building tiny homes. And Mr. Bowman knows this. They spoke to the administration. They wanted to build tiny homes here to take 30 veterans off the street and they, and they would save the city $1.5 million annually. As your mayor, anybody who talks to me about a, a saving plan, I would welcome them into the city. I would not turn them away. And I don't want to tell you what they think of our city and our administration because you guys would be offensive. Pat Martin, you remember Pat Martin? He lives in BC now. I ask him what has he done for people with mental health? And instead of answering me that, my question, what did he do? Call me names. It's on YouTube, you can check it out. Ladies and gentlemen, it's very simple. I would make sure as your mayor, just like Dauphin, I would make sure I work very hard to get the federal provincial government doing one thing and one thing only. Making sure that all that's at the poverty line have a basic livable income. 
I asked the federal government the last federal election, and Pat Martin did not support it, yet people go out and voted for him. He's living in BC right now, and $100,000 worth of pension. We need to wake up people and understand that the people who are promising you don't mean you any well. Talk is cheap. Action is everything. I will find the $75 million that they can't find from the police station and make sure I have invested it into affordable housing. That's the perfect place to end it. Thanks, Don. Thank you very much. Okay, so now, uh, before we take a short break, um, I just want to see if there's anybody in the audience who's running for, um, for, for uh, council, perhaps, or for school trustee, who might just want to pop up and just give us uh, very, just, just a name. I just want a name and where you're running. I see one here. Anybody else? Tell us your name. And, sorry, for Daniel McIntyre. Got it. Great. For council. Anybody else? We just want to give you a, a chance. Okay, that's the only other candidate we have. Okay, on that note, yeah, okay. So um, we're going to take a short break. So as we do that, uh, think of your questions. This is your chance to ask these folks um, your questions. Um, we're going to have volunteers uh, walking around with little pieces of paper and a pen if you're more comfortable writing your question down and passing it up to me. Otherwise, after the break, um, we'll have a mic, a kind of a roving mic. And what we're going to do is we're going to take three questions together, bundle them up, and have our candidates at answer the questions, all three in one shot, just to keep the momentum going. So, yes. Uh, yes, um, at the end, yeah, that would actually be fine, I think. Yeah, we're trying to keep it on time, but that'd be great. So yeah, okay, so 10 minute break. I'm gonna call you back here in 10 minutes-ish. Stretch your legs, thanks very much. Hi, I'm Charles Smidella, Community Events Coordinator for Winnipeg Harvest. And I'm here to walk you through a third party event and hosting your own to help Winnipeg Harvest. So first off, we'll get a request from you. You get an idea. I wanna help Winnipeg Harvest. How do I do that? Do I wanna raise money? Do I wanna raise food? Do I wanna go volunteer? Do I wanna do all of them? So you give us a phone call, you go on our website, send me an email, and we get to talking about your idea. We flesh out the idea. And I'll send you our event agreement, and that basically outlines the who, the what, the when, how many people are gonna be there. All the information comes to us, and we use it for our tracking purposes, so we can help you as much as we can. Now, what do we help you with? A variety of things. We can give you things like stickers or literature, donation forms, coin cans for monetary donations. We also can help you with a variety of different size of bins, just to help you out. Some places, more corporate, you don't necessarily need a bunch of big bins hanging around in your office hallways. You want something smaller. So we can definitely tailor what Winnipeg Harvest gives you for your unique event. So your event happens. During the event, 
Maybe you need a little extra help. Maybe you need a volunteer or two or a small team of them to come out and watch doors. So volunteers are also available if you need them. It's just something we'll discuss when we go through the event agreement. When the event's all over and it's a massive success, and believe me, I know you Manitoba, they're always a massive success. We really appreciate it. Then we come and, well, you have different ways to do this. You can come back to Winnipeg Harvest with the food donations, the monetary donations. We weigh them. We can take a nice picture for your social media, for your office newsletter, for anything you guys need, anything you feel is, is a way to get your point across of how well you accomplished your goal of helping us out and helping yourselves out. On top of that, when everything's counted, monetary, and food-wise, we send you a nice little thank you letter, just a nice little touch from Winnipeg Harvest to say thank you for taking your time to raise money, to raise food, or actually come in here and help yourself to make Winnipeg Harvest help Manitobans help themselves. I'm just gonna be doing some jalapenos. So when we're doing the jalapenos, first of all, I'm gonna take off the top like that. And then I'm gonna slice down through there. And that way I can take out this membrane here and all the seeds, just so it's not as crazy oh, spicy. Oh, just like a normal pepper, yeah. yeah. Jade Hebert is getting yet yeah, another helpful tip in making salsa. And it's all part of the kitchen training program at Winnipeg Harvest, led by Annalisa Shop. Actually, what I'll do is I'll just get you to cut one more tomato. That would okay. be perfect. So I work here in the kitchen as a community kitchen facilitator. So that means I run this 10-week program, which has a lot of focus on practical skills, industry-level certification like WMIS and safe food handling, and then also just for students to get in here and get that practice time with me, serving our lunch that we make every day for free for our over 100 volunteers and staff. I'm growing peppers, cucumbers, tomatoes, and carrots in my garden at home. Oh, nice. That's awesome. I actually was just looking to get into a, a computer course, and someone had told me that Winnipeg Harvest has computer courses, so I applied online, came to the orientation when I got here. They actually had a kitchen training program, a warehouse training program, and a reception training program, and I've always had a keen interest in cooking and being in the kitchen, so I took up the opportunity of uh, applying for the kitchen training program, and that's how I got into it. But if we're doing something like this that we're going to serve the next day, uh, we can be a bit more flexible with the recipes. So that One thing I always love seeing with our, each round of training programs is everyone kind of comes in here, they don't need to know each other yet, and then they start to become friends and also just make this amazing team of all of our volunteers working together to make lunch. And that was something that Jade did immediately. She really wanted to get to know everyone else, work really hard with them. Jade was also a really great communicator and that's so important in a kitchen, whether that's telling which shift she's scheduled for or just even walking behind someone and send a hot pan, you know, to be careful, all that. She also just had really great knife skills. We have her over here cutting some uh, tomatoes for salsa and things like that. And she just was so eager and willing to learn and that's just such a great thing to have in anyone, whether they've been at their job for five years, ten years, or just starting out in that industry. It's been a great opportunity and more people should know about the program because it's very, very good. Winnipeg Harvest is well known for its fight against hunger but now they are putting emphasis on their training programs that are offered to the public free of charge. The key thing is our training programs. A lot of people are surprised when they find out we have training here. So we have that for the kitchen training program, the warehouse, and customer service, and soon to be other new programs that you can find on our website. Another great thing is we offer healthy eating workshops here. So we taught people how to pickle. There's some pickles from uh, previous workshops, how to do salsa canning, as well as just how to make healthy salads and how to cook when you have diabetes and things like that to make healthy food. That's it. And these are all free. Not only are they free, you get to take food home at the end of it. And so these are really great programs that we can offer for people in our community. Great. Yeah, and then we can take some of the salsa to your grad tomorrow, and that's going to be awesome, and you guys can get all your salsa. Oh, I'm so excited about that tomorrow. Yeah. Jade has successfully completed her kitchen training and will be graduating very soon. She recently had her very first job interview, and she feels quite confident. I'm thinking that I might have a chance to get a job, and my future looks good. I have a better chance of obtaining a job as a kitchen helper or a dishwasher or something at this moment so I can start in the kitchen and maybe work my way up uh, as a chef or just a line cook. So I'm very positive that the outcome for being in a kitchen training program will make uh, 
a door open for for a better future for myself. It's just really great, I think, to see how people have grown and seeing people just so confident in the kitchen when before they were very hesitant or maybe not sure how to like cut something the right way and it just feels so amazing to walk in and I can just see them automatically going to do what they need to do. They know other volunteers and staff here at Winnipeg Harvest and they've just made so many friends and connections through the program and I like I hear about them they're going to go hang out after they're done their volunteer shifts together and it's really more than just giving them job skills. You can just see the way they hold themselves with more confidence and are happier and it's just it's really great to be able to be a part of that and just to get to know them as individuals and find out more about them so it's just a great opportunity for that and yeah and then so it's gonna start to cook down and look a little bit more like this oh cool and tomorrow I am graduating and this is my certificate for my completion of the program I work 50 hours and more here volunteering and uh, got a lot of experience now that I didn't have before so I'm really grateful. Yeah, we're gonna let it boil down for a little while once it's coming coming to a rolling boil. All right, uh, so uh, welcome back. Thanks for uh, returning with us after the short break. So we're gonna take questions from the audience now and I've already got kind of a little pile of cards here from folks. It's not too late to write your question down. Um, we've got volunteers here, Molly and Karen, um, who are wandering around. I think you've got papers, but, you, but they do. Oh yeah, we've got papers over here as well. Um, we do also have uh, the two roving mics, Molly and Karen. Um, so if you want to ask a question, we're going to take two from the audience to start from the mics and one paper question. And when we come at you with the mic, we're going to keep it in our hot little hands. We're not going to hand you the mic because we may never get it back. So, so just lean into the mic and, and uh, give us your question. So hold up your hands if you, have, uh, if you have a question. And Karen and Molly will go to you. Karen? Okay, it's Debbie. It's, no, it's not Debbie. Yes, it is. Great. Yes, Thanks, Debbie. Uh, yes. One minute reminder. You only have a minute. Okay. Um, yes, it's me that was on the video. Um, I realize that kids are really important and that kids need a lot of um, help and meals and so on and so forth. But often I've, I've noticed as being a single person on disability, on EIA, I cannot hold down a, a permanent job. Um, and I have noticed that we get caught in the crack at the bottom. And nothing gets done for us, even things are taken away from us instead of, you know, given to us. We are the ones that get stuck in the bottom and the crack. So what do you guys, what do you have to say about that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so folks on, on EIA, what can you do about people who are at the bottom ranks there on employment income assistance. Got it, okay. Okay, Molly. Oh, there's a bunch, oh. Just doing a bunch. Oh. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Sarwar. I have a question, like, uh, somebody got the Nobel Peace Prize about uh, the 
what is called the uh, Provadi issue. It is uh, 2007. His name is Dr. Enos. He's from Bangladesh. So he has some idea. Uh, he gave the loan for the uh, poor people and uh, he started business with them. And those people, they, uh, he solved the property issue at a Bangladesh and he got a Nobel Peace Prize. So we can follow his idea and we can use this city so we can solve this problem. I, I'm not entirely sure I got the question there. Yeah, can you, can I give you another few seconds there to just? Okay, he started the business with the public who is the poor people. So how he deal with poor people, he got, uh, he solved the property issue at Bangladesh. So we can follow the, uh, the, his role and we can solve here those uh, property issues. Okay, small, okay, small business and, and offering property loans to low-income people, is that where we're going with this? Okay, got it, okay, is that, is that an option for for, for the city. Okay, those are our two questions. One, unemployment income assistance. And my, yeah, it sounds like it. Um, and then we've got one question uh, on a card here. Um, do any of you support a raise in the minimum wage to a living wage, about $15 an hour, and if not, why not? So those are the three questions. We've kind of bundled them together. We're hoping you can answer all three in one shot. Um, it's a little tough. Um, and you've got, uh, man, you've got two minutes each, I think. That's kind of harsh, but yeah, two minutes each. And I think, uh, Tim, we're, hmm? Oh yeah, we're gonna come back to you. Yeah, we're, this is round one, and we'll get back to you. That, that, and we, we want to hear them. We're hoping to get to uh, another round. Um, but Tim, can you take those three first? Uh. Nah. <laughs> yes, I can. And yes, I'll stay here as late as you need and as long as they leave this open and answer every question, okay? People who fall through the cracks, people who get subsidized through EI because of uh, conditions that they, they face and that um, they're now subsidized because they've paid into employment insurance. However, it doesn't provide enough. Is that the gist of your question? Yes. When, when, we, when the families get more, we get less. Okay. On yep. the municipal level, I could only say what I say every time that somebody on one level of government says that's not my job. I can tell you that that sounds unjust and that we'd be able to provide a professional witness to assist you in bringing that case forward so that whoever, uh, you're, uh, it's a disability pension? Is that what I'm no. hearing correct? No, not yet? EIA disability. EIA disability. Oh. Uh, all I can tell you is that we would we would provide good witness to assist you with that. We frequently do. They're not going to give me more money. Well, that's more assistant th than just money. You're correct, I, though. More I, money would be the quick and easy way to get that done. Yeah. We'd probably spend more money trying to prevent you from getting more money. <laughs> yes, and then we're going to get back to the third question, which is a living wage. Um, and I'm, I've got to apologize. You're talking about a micro loan. Is that what I'm asking? That you're going to employ people who are unemployable, and we're going to provide business incentive to uh, the doctor uh, from Bangladesh who came up with that business plan. I believe that we have programs that are similar to that at this point. Um, and uh, Skills Unlimited comes to immediate mind for people with learning disabilities. However, um, small businesses. I, I started one 22 years ago. Any incentivization that's going to come from the government. Yeah, but it has to be the level and uh, playing field for everybody so they can access it equally. But I agree with you that if we find people who we identify as unemployable, that we find easier ways and incentivize businesses to do that. So that's bang right on. I do know that there are people to do that privately. Perhaps uh, the municipality can step in and structure that uh, more effectively. And the uh, third one, yes, I support a living wage. 
Great. Thanks, Tim. I was going to offer you another 30 seconds just because you had a little conversation there. But okay, are you good well, with if oh, we're going to talk 30 seconds. Right. Okay. No, okay, good. <laughs> good. Well done. Okay, good. Uh, Brian. Okay. Um, so, uh, good questions. I hope I understood them uh, correctly. Um, in terms of the first one on, uh, on EIA, of course, uh, this is uh, set out by other levels of government, but what we can do uh, certainly, uh, a number of the measures many of us have been speaking about in terms of how we uh, make living in Winnipeg more affordable um, is, is what I'd be focused on, what I've been focused in on. Um, the, the poverty announcement that I, I announced yesterday that's available online um, is, a, is a part of it. Um, the other, of course, is, is just some of the things like making sure that we've got uh, an accessible, safe, and, uh, and low-income bus pass. Um, that's one of the m many measures that we're doing, and part of the reason for the, the poverty um, assessment that we're doing on a number of, of, of things is to make sure that we're looking at it through a lens that thinks about you and your family and families like you in Winnipeg. Um, where are we putting our resources? How do they impact you and your family? And, uh, and how can we do better? And how can we work with other levels of government to, to better address uh, the concern uh, that you've raised. Um, in terms of uh, business loans, I mean, there are a number, Tim is right, there's a number of organizations out there um, that, that do provide uh, loans. Uh, what I've been focused on is just keeping the business environment as competitive as possible and, and grow our economy. And we do that uh, by really trying to help the smallest businesses uh, that need it the most. And so um, increasing the small business tax exemption threshold uh, from I think around 23,000 over 33,000 a year, that's resulted in roughly half of the businesses not paying the business tax in, in Winnipeg, um, as well as lowering the business tax rate, which has been lowered by almost 10% over the last four years. And in terms of a minimum wage and living wage, one of the things we do, of course, at the city of Winnipeg, and I'm really proud that we were able to uh, to ratify a collective agreements that were negotiated in good faith with all of our, our major unions um, is, uh, oh. is uh, I'll just wrap up very yeah. quickly. Sorry, even is, I wasn't paying attention. Sorry we, we do pay, in terms of our employees, we do pay much, we pay more than a living wage. Um, the, um, the question that you've raised, of course, is would we like to look at a living wage? Um, I think we're paying more than, um, and with our contractors, Mr. like Bowman. construction, for instance, uh, they, they pay a lot more. Thanks. Sorry. That was mostly my fault. Yeah. Sorry, Sorry about that. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, Mr. Wilson. Thank you. So you're on a disability, employment, insurance, assistance, EIA, EIA. welfare. Thank you. The problem that you're having right now is tied to that you don't have, you've got to take care of the children. Is that right? Have you got, you're single? I'm single. Okay. On disability. Yeah. On welfare disability. I'm, I'm really trying to get to this thing. Is there, if you, okay, so if we had a, you in a decent place, because I think you're saying that you're at the bottom, you can't get a decent place or anything, right? That's right. Yeah, I, I can't live you can't do that. One meal a day. Yeah. If I take the bus, return trip, yeah. that's, two, uh, that's a day and a half worth of meals for me. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you make a choice, bus or, yeah. or a meal. Yeah. So where I'm at with this is that I, the basic income Manitoba is designed to float all boats and to go from $4 a day to something where you can actually be healthy could have better food and, and have a more stable environment and not be so worried about the place you're in, you could look at then taking another step and going on to, there's got to be something that you could be doing, working. This is, jobs is where we do solve a third of our problems if we have a job. I'm just... Maybe as an advocate, As an advocate, okay. Okay, there you go, exactly. And this is what Basic Income Manitoba is about. It's about people who don't get paid for things that they do for the community and for their fellow people and for their community centers. It's a great idea. The Winnipeg Chamber of Commerce has jumped up in front of it and behind it a couple of times. The province has been interested in it. It is a way of us injecting money into the economy. 
And it, it gives us that opportunity if we focus on small business and young people being futurepreneurs, we can take all of these components and move them together and move forward. The key, and it goes for all three of this, you have an idea, microloans, yes, absolutely. And the living wage, yes. But the key is, is that we move all these things at the same time and we get all of the city to buy into this at once. We need the city committed to making itself healthier. Thank you. And, uh, oh, no, Debbie, I got, I got to, I got to move on. We'll, yeah, we'll yeah, talk yeah. After. We're all kind of cattywampus with our time here. So yeah, uh, yeah, uh, Umar, over to you. Debbie, I can give you answer. Back to Debbie. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry about it. I'm economy and finance guy. Uh, at the early, sorry to say, they don't know economy and finance. I can tell you right now. Simple is answer. Debbie City has no money. And all of the candidates, including she is not here, they are just going to freeze property taxes. They don't know where they're taking the revenue in our city, which is going to file the bankruptcy next 10 years. Okay? There's a simple answer. And second thing, because everyone's scared to talk about raised property taxes. My incumbent is the only guy who talk about 2.33%, but he still, I wish he can go to dig out more financial statements so he can understand we're going to be really big trouble next four years. But as, it's okay, I can give you a simple answer. Debbie, we need money. I'm going to be sell your six golf courses next four years. That's answer, okay? And I'm taking $50 million, all of you guys, Winnipeggers, taxpayers' money. Put into, into your poverty, Homelessness, affordable housing, and low income bus pass is going to be happen in Winnipeg. Second thing, I'm gonna quick because I have only two minutes. Debbie, I'm gonna give you later all in details. My, the, uh, sorry, Sunny, what you're talking about, I know. It's bank called Microfinance Bank. And problem is that what is Microfinance Bank? People, they don't understand how Microfinance Bank work. It's not gonna happen in Winnipeg. All seven or eight candidates, they haven't checked the financial statements. City of Winnipeg right now. What are they gonna go to start a microfinance bank? It's not gonna happen. It's, they are not a finance guy. They don't know economy. Third thing, guys, I'm gonna tell you right now. Simple living wage, $15 is not gonna happen in Winnipeg. I'm not against it, but it's gonna be hard small businesses. Look at their Ontario. They did adopt it, $14. They messed up their economy. One time I'm talking about to promote small businesses. If I'm not gonna promote small businesses, if I raise $15, cost of a product goes up. And if the cost of product goes up, people, they're not going to buy it. Simple. I'm not against $15 minimum and wage. And that's it. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought you were wrapping up there. <laughs> Thanks, Umar. Okay, Don. Okay. So, I'm a small business owner, and I do employ people, so I do know basic math and economics. And because uh, I've been doing this for four and a half years. And um, it's hard to listen to my dear friend say that I don't know, but we have a very successful operation. It may be small, but it's very successful, thanks to my wife and others. So, Debbie, the, federal, the provincial government has robbed us of a number of things, and there are certain things that we can do. But here's what I am going to process, um, put to you folks. If we have the tax base currently as it is, we can't help you. But if we, for any reason, we are able to have a settlement department of the city of Winnipeg, which is what I propose, that when we encourage immigration and encourage people to come here, we will then turn around. Boy, that was a fast minute. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're able to turn around and increase the tax base without increasing the taxes. Hence, I want to invest money into the core neighborhoods so that we can help people like yourself and others because there's a help that's needed. I want to end corporate welfare. Um, so if anybody donate to my campaign, I sign a conflict of interest and I ask the folks here to sign it because the city of Winnipeg do have a conflict of interest but it does not include donors to your campaign, and it doesn't include family members, so I've added that as an amendment, and they won't sign it. I am going to make sure that we understand that we need to grow the tax base in order to help you and others, and yes, I would increase, and we can get to $15,
but we have to first understand that the, the tax base have to be grown wider, more people coming into the city. And in terms of the low income... No, no, um, that's thing, the yeah, moment. It. It's all done. <laughs> Thanks, Don. <laughs> Mr. Ackerman. This will be short. <clears throat> um, Can I take a minute? No. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll spread it among the people who don't have enough time. Um, I don't really understand welfare. Um, I understand about being ward of the state. Um, I was in on welfare three months of my life in Ontario. I had two children. I owned a house, and it was very, 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 very difficult to get any kind of help when you own property. I did it the last minute. Um, I don't know what welfare pays. I, don't, I didn't know what EIA stood for, but I'm a staunch, independent person. I've been getting some help from my family, but I was paying $315 for a tiny office where I slept on the floor there. There's a washroom in the building. I wasn't supposed to sleep there, but that was where I was living. I don't have that office anymore. Um, as far as you know, living for under $600, um, I was living way under that. And I'm going to now applaud all of the agencies that are involved in the poverty industry. All the agencies that are actually helping have helped me. Um, if you have a place where you can actually sleep, it's possible to get around without a bus. It's possible, if you're healthy enough, and it's possible to get enough to eat here and there. There's little helps that aren't on the books. Like I did mention Harvest. I've never gone into Harvest there because I don't want to stand in line. But they don't surveil their dumpster bin. They allow people, knowing them, because there's cameras there, knowing that some people are actually taking something from there and they're letting them get away with it. There's a lot of little helps all the way through these systems that are helping people out. Now, I mean, I don't know... Stop. <laughs> I don't know EIA and I don't know about microloans, but I think those are really important compared to the uh, Money Mart as a bank. Thanks, Ed. Appreciate it. Okay. Okay, I think that runs us through our first set of questions. We're gonna go to round two now. So same process. Um, I've got uh, one really great question here I wanna ask um, on paper, but now uh, Kate and Molly are gonna go through the audience. Uh, so please hold up your hand if you have a question. And while they're doing that, I will read this first paper question. So uh, uh, you with me guys? Yep, paying attention now? Good, great, good. Okay, uh, so the first question, um, as we're checking with the audience here, um, how will you return Winnipeg to an affordable place to live for Winnipeggers? In the last three years, city services have risen um, by a considerable percentage, I can't quite read the writing, sorry folks, um, which includes uh, things like uh, property taxes, parking fees, bus fare, all of these things have gone up in the city of Winnipeg. So how do you, um, if you're the mayor, how will you return the city to an affordable level? So that's the first question. So now, Molly, take it away. How are you going to vote for us to vote for you? Second, what is your experience is of impact or motivation of why you do what you do? What is your main focus of you, you candidates for running for this election? I personally think we need to do less chit chat and more action. Everyone has an asshole, but we all use it, but nobody likes it when it smells. Okay. Okay, so, you're, so as I take your question, uh, the main focus of them as candidates, why they decided to run, is that, do I got it? Ish? Okay, okay, yes is all I need. Okay, all right, great. Okay, action, yes, okay. Okay, do we have one more, Kate? Uh, hello, my name is Alexandra, I'm a student at the University of Winnipeg. Um, I was just wondering if you guys are going to be implementing a poverty reduction plan, um, how you're going to be taking a participatory approach to that, um, including the input from the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. They've done an alternative budget that is very interesting that I've done, uh, I've read it through class. Um, so considering that like alternative budgets as well as local organizations, um, people who are currently home homeless or previously have been homeless um, in this decision making process for implementing a policy. 
Okay, that's good. Everyone, uh, everyone with me with those three? Those are great. Uh, okay, so first, uh, it's actually Mr. Bowman. Thank you. You're going first. Nice light questions, thank you very much. Um, so the, the, the first question um, was on uh, affordability. And the first thing is, um, municipal government, like all governments, needs to respect the dollars that come into City Hall and make sure that they're being spent wisely. And one of the things that we did in this most recent year's budget, uh, better than any year's budget in the history of the City of Winnipeg, is lower the, ex the expenditure growth rate of the size of government to its lowest level. So what that means is, uh, effectively, rather than just growing the size of government, which costs money to, to do, and, and it's our money as, as Winnipegers, um, is, is scrutinize those dollars um, much harder than they've been scrutinized uh, in the past. And so um, in terms of affordability, uh, we have amongst uh, one of the most affordable cities of major cities uh, in Canada, and we need to continue to make sure that we, we make it easier for people to live. The, the stats at the beginning of, of tonight, in terms of 100,000 and, and then some, um, is, is staggering. And that shows us that we still obviously have much more work to do. Um, in terms of uh, why run, I, the, the reason I'm running is uh, I just simply want to move this city forward. Um, I was frustrated by what I was seeing in the past. And this is my way of giving to community and, and, and contributing to public service. I'm not looking to do this as a career. Uh, I had a career, um, and I, I want to get back to it. Uh, not next week, but, uh, <laughs> but that's going to be up to you. <laughs> Um, and then the third thing is uh, in the poverty plan. So I, as, as I've, I've committed to do is, is to develop that plan. We've started that process. Um, it, you'd mentioned um, speaking with uh, members uh, or, or Winnipeggers affected by homelessness. And um, the street census, I think, has been an invaluable effort. Um, and I want to thank all those organizations and individuals that have helped with, uh, with that street census. I think we've learned a lot and we'll continue and we'll consult, of course, in the development of the poverty plan. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Bowman. Thanks. Mr. Wilson. I would like you to return to your practices next week. <laughs> to return Winnipeg to affordability, we have to look at extraneous costs. Winnipeg is a fairly affordable city at the present time in this very complicated country called Canada. Uh, but it doesn't really work 100% because if we talk about the housing prices, well, when we're talking about housing prices nowadays, we're not really talking about something that's in everybody's wheelhouse anymore. So we have to take steps, like I've said, where we reimagine the transit system so it's functional and effective for all people, suburbs and core area, and it's open and it's free. We need to lower the cost of living in this city. Affordable housing is a key aspect to it. I've talked to you about some of the plans that we go where we start replicating projects for those that are in need of support in order to transfer on to employment and their own sustainable lifestyle. When we talk about action and everybody having an asshole, yes, it's true. And my mama raised me to behave and not do those things. And we have to bring that back in. Now, 10 years ago, the Healthy Child program started. Teresa Oswald was the first person to mention it in Manitoba. These programs work but we still have more to do we, of the existing poverty issues. We have to make sure we feed people, but we also have to make sure we find a place for them and a job for them. So action, we have to act on taxes, fees and services, minimizing the costs to the, the, the most in need. When we talk about poverty reduction and CCPA, you're involved. Massive employment in the frontline service workers. Thank Thanks. you for those three questions. Thanks, Mr. Wilson, good timing. Mr. Hyatt. I'm gonna quick save. I'm gonna come second to a first question. Why I'm running? I am running because I do believe Winnipeg, we have a tremendous opportunities for a growth. All we need are leadership. How? For example, affordable housing. City has only three developers monopoly. They do develop the land 
and they're giving you a lot cost, 150 to 200,000 dollars. Tell me, I'm giving you idea. That's not a city of Winnipeg's job to give you, a, we have a huge land. Why not we, city of Winnipeg, develop this land? And I can give you as a realtor background. You know how much cost would you to develop a brand new home? And a lot, only fifty to $70,000. And a brand new home, only $200,000. Instead of a four hundred dollars to $500,000. Because right now, three developers, they develop the land. That's the city of Winnipeg's job, to develop the land. Second thing, I'm going to come right now, even a snow clearing budget. $45 million you guys paying right now to snow clearing. Third party is picking up your snow. Why not city of Winnipeg to buy on lease to on equipment? One of us service would be better. And the second, you guys save money. Third thing, because only two, three minutes. Uh, Canadian policy alternative. I read this book minimum 100 times. That's I learned politics from them. Only problem with the Canadian alternative policies, they put taxes so much on residential and business, which I'm against, frankly speaking. I do have ideas without raising taxes. That's I said, they're talking about $100 million revenue to raise taxes from business and residential homes. And I said, I'm going to be sell your golf courses. Even Winnipeggers has to decide, do they need arts or a food? Do you need an ambulance service or a arts? You have to be decide, do you need a low income bus pass or a golf courses? Look at the plan, simple. No one talking about cutting, but please, I know it's hard. Thank you, really appreciate it. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Hyde. Appreciate it. Okay, Don, over to you. Thank you so much. A quick give answer. No, 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 no. no. Yeah, that was an excellent point. I think you can address that as uh, as the as the night wears on. I think I need to go to Don. Thank you. Okay. So one of the reasons why I said that we should freeze taxes at this point is because for whatever reason we have been caught into this vicious cycle of seem to be gouging the taxpayers in this city. I'm, I'm one of those who feels it because as a small business owner, I'm gonna tell you this much, people are hurting out there. And we may pretend as if it's rosy, but it's not. Sorry if that comes across wrongly, but that's the reality. I'm gonna keep it real, folks. I'm not gonna to pretend to you. Um, the amount of money that we waste in the city of Winnipeg and all the projects overrun, and nobody seemed to care about it. You know what happened in Ottawa? Because my wife and I was there in June. When the city of Winnipeg give a project out and the developer is late, guess who pays? Not you. The developer does. What's wrong with us? Why are we having um, projects overrun and, and, and we pay? $200 million for the stadium, $75 million um, worth of money just gone in thin air and nobody can find it. Um, I want to increase the tax base without increasing your taxes by encouraging and keeping people to stay right here. That's the difference. Me, why I'm running, the med crisis is close to me. My wife would tell you any minute now, she could hear a you know, phone call that says that she has lost her niece. And it's not a joke. And we sit down for four years before we come up with a plan. Who are we kidding? Like, folks, I mean, I don't understand this. Homelessness, we can end it. And for me, I want to put it on the table. We can end homelessness, but most importantly, I want to invest into the core community, something that we have forgotten. And I've said it on my plan, and I'm happy to see everybody you now leaning to that way. That's good. So win, lose, or draw, I would have made a difference, and that's why I'm running. Okay. The action plan that's needed is not a talk anymore, it's action, just that. Let's start doing, okay? Perfect, perfect place to end. Thanks, Don. That was, that was me. Ed. Testing one, dude. Action. First of all, we need art. We need art. And I'm only going to answer one of the questions. I drew four pictures here. So I, can you people see them? Yeah, okay. We need our art gallery. Yeah. Okay, the, <clears throat> first of all, my mother's a dietitian. My dad is a... Professor of Agricultural Economics, I grew up with my dad as an investment counselor, so I know all the bullshit about numbers and bullshit about food. Um, I grew up with food religion, and I also know the difference between bullshit and hawk, and uh, <clears throat> uh, the difference between bullshit and horseshit. You can play hockey with horseshit in the winter. That's the difference, okay. So I'm gonna talk about action, 
And I've got four pictures here. One is a granary, and uh, that we're in a province of agriculture, and I suggest that we have granaries in communities, and people share by putting grain in the grain bins and share them. Uh, for example, for $100, across from Dino's, I'm not sure the name of the, the place, you can get 100 pounds of black beans made, grown in Manitoba, and uh, they're a dollar a pound. So, I mean, it's actually 90 cents, but add some tax. It's a, a dollar a pound, you get 100 pounds of black beans. You can live on that for a while if you have a place to cook them. Um, I'm proposing grain bins, so changing a few bylaws to allow that kind of thing in town. I'm uh, proposing making tiny houses and build them here. And to get around the bylaws here is if they're licensed from out of province, they can be built here, and it's not called a trailer park. And people can help build them if they build five they get one free. Um, I'm also uh, suggesting um, the rail yards to be uh, not expropriated, but start taking the outer lanes for people to live in rail cards, make tiny homes on rails that are mobile and people to build them. Um, any homes are mostly building cabinet. It's like mostly finishing work. Um, and also tiny homes in boats, because we have slow moving rivers and uh, one more thing. No, no. I know it says stop. Um, I own <laughs> three houses, and it, they cost sixty-six thousand for all three. One was three thousand. One was twenty-five thousand. One thirty-seven thousand okay. plus a thousand. So it comes to sixty-six thousand okay. for three properties. Thanks, They're all Ed. torn down by the city. I've been in court Thanks, for ten Ed. years, <laughs> and the city spent half a million dollars fighting me on that. Thank you. Okay, the last word goes to Tim. I'll be quick. I'll be quick. <laughs> Affordable level. Should be good now? Sorry, thought I fell asleep again. Okay, good. no, I'm here, I'm here. The affordable level, uh, there's a lot of things coming on the horizon that are gonna be able to affect um, this as it comes. So to have hope and vision, the electrification of transit is gonna make it a lot much lower cost. It'll be more nimble, it'll be, there's exciting things on the horizon with that and it's not so far off. Uh, and that's gonna lower costs for everybody and that's gonna expand transportation, which is a big cost when you're, uh, impoverished, you don't have your own car. Um, but one of the things that, to bring them over in a more, I'm sorry, to be more immediate with uh, finding a more affordable level is to seek out the efficiencies that are happening in the city or a lack of efficiency. I work there. I could tell you that we're not very efficient at what we do. And yeah, a lot of people have pointed out that um, I'm talking about the efficiency of a police service, which is one third of our budget. Well, I could tell you that the philosophy that permeates throughout all of these uh, uh, budgets is the uh, conflation that politicians have with cost and value. And I, rather than use up all my time explaining that, uh, I will just say that I am probably the only one up here who's going to be able to have that kind of insight into operating within the, uh, the structure of the city of Winnipeg. And I do know exactly who to talk to about getting that working a whole lot more efficiently. And that will lower costs. And that money, in effect, will be passed on to make it more affordably live at 30 seconds. Um, why am I running? Well, I'm going to be quick here, and this has a lot to do with probe research. I went and met with uh, Scott McKay early on to uh, get my bearings and get my ducks in a row because I saw a cause, and that's where I'm at. I rise to a cause because I see injustice. 79.83% is what methamphetamine and crime polled at recently. When I started off, it was 4% and 7% respectively for combined 11%, and I'm stopping, but I made my point, and my cause... Uh, was done, and I got a lot to say about poverty and homelessness, but I ran out of time. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, we are nearing the end of uh, our time together, but we've got just a little smidge of time uh, before we go to uh, closing statements. Um, and I'm gonna remind you that uh, the candidates are willing to stay afterwards once our live stream is done. Um, we can uh, keep going once the live stream is done on Hue. I, see, I do see questions back there. Um, I have to tell you, I have a really great question here. And what I propose to do, if Kate and Molly are okay with this, is have a quick lightning round, one minute each. Jennifer, you're on it, one minute each. Because I do want to ask this question before we move to, uh, uh, to, uh, to a closing statements. Is that okay with the candidates? Do I have your consent? Okay, good. Okay, and this actually touches on something we've already, we've already talked about already. Um, there are in this city some incentives, considerable incentives that developers have to develop on the margins of the city. 
what kind of incentives or programs would you offer to, to create infill housing and new housing and, and new development in the core, in the north end? And I think this question is particularly, um, it, it's all, all kinds of development, but I think housing is a particular need. So if, it's, if I have the consent of the room, I'd like our candidates to address that. Is that going to be okay? Okay. Okay. So now, uh, Doug, you're first. Your, your turn first. And one minute. Watch Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer. One of the things that's really exciting about having been a mayor and taken four years and spent 24 hours and seven days a week being excited and being committed to this incredible, thriving, living corporation. That's what cities are. They're corporations. But it's still, there's a, still a human aspect to it. And the exciting part is leading people to the future there is no reason why we cannot develop a plan with a properly staffed city planner's office responsible to communication with the developers of the city in agreement, build vertically. We need to increase the population at 3% in the city of Winnipeg like the other cities in our province. Remember, the province is 40% not Winnipeg. There are lots of lessons to learn and one of them is to work with developers towards affordable housing, towards higher densities, and to stopping promptly when you are told. Thanks, Doug. Perfect. Okay. Umar, one minute. Can you do it in one minute? I know Definitely you can. Definitely I would um, consider myself for a big promoter of infill housing. Second, housing we can address. It's not a big rocket science. Simple answer is that city of Winnipeg do have a tons of equipment. City of Winnipeg have tons of free land. All is, is a new idea I'm not giving you a Winnipegger. Just step in and develop it. Instead of a private developer, they are making billions of dollars. City of Winnipeg, and it's not going to be happen in Winnipeg at the first time. All over the world is going to be happen. So only lot cost when you have a 50 to $70,000, then you can build a new home for $200,000. So it's not even a North End issue. We have a huge South. Uh, east, west, big land. Just step in and give a start a vision for the city for as a mayor so you can understand how we are different from rest of the world. So people that we are not living in Toronto where we are going to buy the home for 400000 to 500000 I'm going to give the brand new home for $200,000. That's my promise. Thank you. Woo, that's like the Oprah promise. Okay, Don, over to you. Okay. As a, as a North Ender, I gotta tell you, I, you know, my wife and I lived in the North End right now, and um, it's very pleasing to me to sit here and listen to that question because from day one, I'm, one I'm, I, I'm, I'm the only one put it in paper that we need to be investing into the core neighborhoods. So I'm very happy that we finally get to that point where we can understand that we need to do it. Dan Led says it, that if the core is healthy, everything else is healthy. Okay, and, and I'm okay with that, and I'm okay with everybody realizing that, but here's the difficulty. And I'm going to ask you to, to make sure you, you hold everybody responsible for this. Whether whoever wins, you hold them to the fact that this, this is not a talk time, tea time thing. It's an actual thing that must be done. And the only way you're going to do that is to cut out the corporate welfare. My plan is very, very simple. The people who can afford to borrow eight, nine, ten million dollars, they ain't getting a penny from the city. We're going to spend all of that money where? Into the core neighborhoods so, so we can make sure we build the core neighborhoods, keep the people out of trouble. Thanks, Don. Perfect. Thanks. All right. Mr. Ackerman. Testing one, two. Okay. Nobody has a monopoly on good ideas. It's more of a Scrabble game. Uh, uh, thank you. I said it's a Scrabble game. You said it's a monopoly game. It's a Scrabble game. Two, Don, you said uh, Winnipeg is a <coughs> corporation. Let's make Winnipeg a cooperative. Three, um, this is the last one. Action. Um, I want to make a tiny house, and I want to challenge everyone in the audience to come and help do it. And uh, for the price of zero, Bodegos is going to be torn down. Let's take that and make it a t tiny house, at least one. Thanks, Ed. Mr. Dyack, one minute. One minute. Yep. I proposed this early on. Uh, I had meetings with people who knew what they were talking about when it came to house development and realized... I had a business sense and I recognized the parasitic loss 
the government always manages to put on things. So when it comes to infill housing, I'd make an exception for the builders and allow them a ratio of number of houses built that they could barter their impact fee or their money that they would give to government, which we would later suspect was misused, and they would be able to show a direct impact by providing a house. It doesn't have to be an infill. It could be a, a restoration for an inefficient house because a lot of the old houses are horribly inefficient. But what this would allow it to do is that people who know what they're doing when they're building houses can build houses a lot cheaper than independents, unless, of course, you're a nonprofit. But if you're an independent doing infill housing, you're going to have a much uh, harder time getting the concrete poured, the permits. Well, it turns out the only thing I had wrong was the ratio. It's not one in seven. They said it would be profitable uh, for all parties involved if it were a little bit higher. Well, let's work out the math and let's get them to barter. Let's get the people who know what they're doing to build these infill houses okay. and let's get started. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Mr. Bowman. So Winnipeg's population has grown from 698,000 to over 750,000 in the last four years. And that's a good thing. Uh, as we get bigger, we want to get better and we want to get more sustainable. And so one of the toughest political battles that I've had over the last four years was introducing the impact fees. If you want to talk about... Um, unmitigated uh, suburban sprawl where existing taxpayers, uh, each of you, uh, were, uh, were subsidizing the costs of growth. Uh, that's something that we've, we've mitigated significantly with the introduction of the impact fees. And so uh, it wasn't an easy battle. Uh, it's been talked about for many, many, many years. And um, if you want to talk about action, that's one that I believe will help build a much more sustainable Winnipeg going forward. Um, infill is incredibly important. And it's why we're developing the new infill strategy. And right now it's in phase two. Uh, it is something that there's a tremendous, about a, a, a tremendous amount of consultation going on right now. Um, but the impact fee doesn't apply downtown right now. And of course, uh, the infill uh, development guidelines uh, will help us develop in a smarter way than we've done in the past. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so now uh, I'm trying to keep us on a schedule for our live stream. We actually have quite a few viewers who are watching us uh, live online. So we are exactly on time. I want to keep up with this, uh, uh, with, uh, with, with, with this uh, good, good energy. And I know I see questions. I know there are questions. I know there are questions over here. But we're going to move to uh, closing statements. And we will stay afterwards and take all your questions as long as the candidates um, can stay. I think they'll all be amenable to that. I see you. But we're going to move to uh, just to the closing statements for now. Okay, so uh, closing statements, two minutes each. Um, Mr. Hyatt, I think uh, we're back to where we started with you. Yeah. Uh, simple is, I can say everyone promising right now to freeze property taxes. One of the candidate only said 1.16 percent. My incumbent said 2.33 percent. We can't grow as a society. Simple answer is this, if they, I'm not sure who's going to be elected in October 24th. Simple answer is this, we have $1.7 billion debt, guys. This year deficit, $89 million. And they are scared to talk about property taxes. It's okay, I only said 2% too. 1% is going to be regional, 1% is going to be local, and 0.33% I'm taking off from rapid transit. But look at there, I do not shy to talk about cutting even arts gallery. Look at there, I know, I'm not gonna elect it probably for this thing, but I have a courage to speak up. Winnipeg, we can't grow as a cut $5.6 million to give Winnipeg Art Gallery. And special, I'm going to be sell golf courses? I agree. No one is gonna might be vote for me because I'm going to be self your precious asset for uh, Winnipeg Golf Courses for raising $50 million. But who's gonna balance the books then? And who's gonna give you, reduce your ambulance cost? Who's gonna give you one hour street fee parking at hospitals, emergency, urgent care, cancer care? My idea 24 seven construction in Winnipeg. And I already said low income bus pass. How am I gonna be happen low income bus pass in Winnipeg? It's cost $10 million. And already I said I'm reducing bus fare $2.95 to two seventy. So I'm sure I did three, four promises. So I have to be kept my promising. Same Winnipeg labor force is $857 million. It's already raised over double the inflation rate for last 10 years, $400 million. So I said my incumbent did a great job for 1%, but I'm going to increase only 0.25%. So I'm uh, saving $12 million from there. Simple is, I know every day, day they come up and give a new statement, new press release to make a new promise. One of the candidate promised for $2.9 billion even. Please be realistic. Check the financial statements before to make any press release. Thank you. Thank you, sir.
Don, last words. This is when I have to stand up. I've asked you folks to follow me on journeys already before. When we said let's change the, you know, the name change from garbage day to recycle day. And we all saw the difference in 10 years what it has done. I've, I've, I've even gone far and get all of the major malls and grocery stores together and promote the business of reusable bags. Today, Dollarama is selling reusable bags. Listen to this. I'm asking you this time. Come with me and give me your vote on this vision. We can end the crisis that we're having with crime every single day. Crime, 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 and nobody knows how to stop it. And the answer is to invest into the core neighborhoods. Simple, effective. Nobody else is doing it, and I am suggesting that we need to do this. I'm going to freeze the taxes because we pay enough taxes already. We've been burdened enough already. And how am I going to do that? If there's 100 of us in this room and we have to pay taxes, how if we had 200 people in the room, our taxes will be lowered, right? Yes? So here's the deal. How we get that is to have a, a, a resettlement, a settlement department with the city of Winnipeg to encourage and keep people from leaving Winnipeg once they get here. And, and so we can grow the tax base without increasing the taxes. Crime capital and the med crisis, tiny homes. Tiny home community is nothing new. Homes for Heroes came here and begged us to do some business with them and we turned them away. In the first six months of my taking office, if I get your vote, we will build tiny homes to put people in because it saved the city money. The federal government knows this, everybody knows this, so why are we not building? It doesn't take four years to build homes for homeless for people. It does not take four years, it takes only months. Why was it not done? Don't listen to the talk, don't listen to the promises because they do not believe even their own speech. They're just saying it because they want your vote. Vote for Don Woodstock. Thank you. Ed. Okay, I'm looking for a promise. <laughs> uh, this is a challenge. Um, I'm serious about this. The Bodegos restaurant on the corner of Albert and Arthur and Bannatyne is going to be torn down. Um, I'm suggesting that for a price of zero, uh, we can actually get, put, get together and take it apart carefully, move it up the street, and use the parts to build at least one smaller building. So after tonight, it's like whoever wants to try and do this, the owner of the building, they've already got permission to tear it down. They're going to keep the brick building, but the, uh, the smaller building is going to be torn down. If we can use the pieces, we could make more than one house, I'm sure, like a, a small one. But the thing is, there's, there's three posts there in the middle of it, so it's like it can't be moved as one piece because there's so many windows. It's kind of a lean-to anyway, but uh, I'm looking for a promise now from you all. My mom's from Arkansas, I can say y'all. <clears throat> uh, anyone, any of y'all that want to come and help do this, uh, come on down and uh, we'll see if we can put it together for fun. This, is, uh, this isn't really an election, um, this is a who cares-a-thon. But after the election we're stuck living here, so let's see what we can do uh, while well, we have some time. But the awesome part is like maybe we can get a sitcom out of this, because I think well, that's what this really is. Thank you. <laughs> and now uh, do we have 30 seconds for our sponsor. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Ackerman. Oh, Mr. Dyack, final words. <sighs> I'm, I'm going to respond to Umar's uh, suggestion that we're not going to be able to achieve objectives if we don't continue to raise taxes. And I am one of the candidates who uh, contradicts that. I say, yes, we can. But I am uh, an inside guy, and I have the uh, insight into how the things work and how we can find efficiencies. And I could argue it's like running your house and your heat bill. Um, you know, maybe invest in some insulation, maybe get better windows, and uh, you know, get a different furnace. And these are all things that uh, we could look at doing, and that'll lower your overall cost. But that requires some investment. Infrastructure comes to mind. Um, but one of the things I've avoided talking about because it is. Um, hard to measure right now because it's fast and dynamic and it's overwhelming, is the effect of addiction on our impoverished. I mean, we can't afford addiction treatment for those who can't afford Aurora or any of these other private clinics that we like to promote. And from my perspective, the people who suffer the most are the people who are poor, the people who are struggling with raising their children, who have a spouse or a family member 
who is uh, battling a very, very horrible addiction. So I don't want to sound doom and gloom, but we really need to pick up our socks and uh, we need to be able to be effective in helping people, especially with these uh, challenges we face now. Having said that, I have a lot of faith and hope in our city. I'm not uh, sounding, dis I hope I'm not sounding desperate. I am? Who said? <laughs> yeah, oh, sorry, three decades of dealing with the problems in the face and being there hands on with it gives me a bit of a different perspective than a lot of other people. But I still have hope and that's why I'm here. I just also want to not be uh, blinded by the uh, rhetoric as Don states. I do want action and I know what action looks like. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, well, I want to thank you, Mary Agnes, for, uh, for uh, being the moderator tonight. And I want to thank all the organizations who, uh, who continue to do outstanding work in our community. Uh, I would also encourage, um, uh, Ed, I would encourage you to maybe speak with the leadership of Winnipeg Harvest about some of your comments tonight. They do really good work, and um, I'm really proud to volunteer at, at Harvest. The one thing I'm going to take issue with is, um, is, is Umar. We, we agree on a lot of things. You are you are very fiscally conservative. Um, I will say, on that basis, that you should be supporting art in our community because for every $1 we put in, we get $18 back from private sources and other levels of government, and it's 6% of our workforce. And so it's a good, it's a good financial investment. It also builds a, a city that we can be proud of. The, the, the reason I'm running is, is um, it has been an honor to serve as Winnipeg's 43rd mayor. Um, and I want to continue to build Winnipeg for the future, and I want to do it in a positive, collaborative way. Um, we haven't had a chance tonight to talk about mental health and addictions in the way that, uh, that we, we need to as a community and continue working towards it. Uh, I'm very proud to have supported the Bruce Oak Memorial Recovery Center. It, this was something the local councillor fought very hard, and uh, we got it through council to, to help, and it's going to help some people in our community. There's a lot more that we need to reach. The issues that we talked about tonight uh, are very much a part of, as we grow, how do we improve the quality of life for the residents that, that call Winnipeg home? And so uh, I care deeply about the issues that we've talked about, whether it's uh, action on homelessness, which we've been leading on uh, and, and helping, whether it's the Food Council, whether it's uh, many of the very, very serious and complex issues, the way that we're going to solve them uh, isn't alone. It is through collaboration and dialogue with other levels of government, frontline stakeholders. You have my commitment. If I'm fortunate enough to continue serving as your mayor uh, after election day, I will continue to do that with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the final, final word, Mr. Wilson. In May of this year, I was asked by a rather uppity and very interesting and entertaining opinion writer for one of the media. What's the number one issue in Winnipeg? Oh, and he also said, do you know Jason Trier? But I don't know. I mean, everybody knows Jason Trier. But this really caught me off guard. He says, what's the number one issue in Winnipeg? And I said, poverty. And everything that we've talked about tonight has had a direction towards that. But I do, and, and I've talked to you about 2022 and, and re-engaging the, the province and the feds and, and knowing how to do this because Pallister was my member of parliament when I was mayor of Winnipeg and Cameron, our minister... <laughs> oh, did I just jump ahead four years? Thank you, Chris. Mayor of Morden, thank you, Brian. The, so what we have is we do have to build those relationships and we do have to find common ground. I am clearly standing for Basic Income Manitoba and asking to work with Brian Pallister and, and the federal government as well. I do also want to reach out to the Winnipeg Labour Council. I know they haven't nominated anybody and I feel responsible for not having approached them for their support. Uh, I do also believe in massive recruitment of front end lines. Of our, of our safety, of our health care system. I want to help the, the, the homeless uh, issue by having people, soldiers on the ground, and, and we build this up, and we, and we bring all people in, all, all, all abilities get used towards these goals. I also want to say that small business, futurepreneurs, uh, 
the review of the uh, poverty reduction report includes jobs. Jobs, jobs, jobs. Thank you for everybody. Thank you. Thanks, all of you. So uh, the, the candidates are right. We didn't cover uh, addictions. We didn't cover um, uh, the role of mental health in poverty and homelessness. But we did cover a lot of ground uh, tonight. We talked about low-income bus passes several times, basic uh, income, infill housing, welfare, a living wage, a lot of Pat Martin, um, you know, particip participatory uh, uh, budgeting, tiny homes. We covered a lot of ground on this very uh, complicated issue. And I want to remind you that you can stay behind. We're going to end the formal part of our, uh, uh, of our forum tonight and kind of end the live stream. And uh, Molly has some stuff, I guess. Uh, is this for me? Thank you so much. Oh, well, thank, for you. Your okay, thank you. Okay, good. Thank you. But, but thank you. But I want to thank all of you for your excellent questions, and I, and I very much want to thank the candidates for coming out tonight. You have really a diverse set of perspectives on this issue, and you gave us your whole evening, and it's a, you've taken some tough questions. Thank you sincerely uh, on behalf of the organizers for joining us tonight. As I say, we can stay behind uh, and talk some more, um, but this is the end of our, uh, of our formal uh, uh, forum. So please, a round of applause for the candidates. Thank you all. dull moment here at Winnipeg Harvest. Their success relies though on their hardworking volunteers. I'm the food distribution manager so I um, am responsible for bringing food in and out of the building. We move 13 million pounds of food every year so that's roughly a million a month that uh, we have our drivers going out to different stores around the city and um, picking up from them and then also driving out to all the food banks that we work with. We work with over 400 agencies throughout the province to distribute food. Overall, we have roughly 200 volunteers per day. Um, drivers, we have, uh, say, about um, five to 10 on any given day. Uh, ideally, we have 10 every day. And um, we also have volunteers in our warehouse that are putting together the orders for the food banks, another 10 volunteers in the day. Uh, we have shifts in the morning, afternoon, and evening available. Uh, for drivers, we have morning and afternoon shifts and uh, Saturday shifts as well. For our drivers, we're looking for people who um, are happy to be uh, physically active. Um, there is some lifting involved in um, picking up food from stores. Those who pick up food from the stores, it's slightly lighter lifting. The people who are delivering food to food banks, it's a little bit heavier. Uh, 25 pounds is sort of the max that we try to have at one time, so it's still really great. Uh, we tend to have a lot of um, retired folks who like to drive for us. Um, they're available during the days when we need them and looking for something to do, so. You can go to our website, there's a volunteer page there that has our phone number to connect with our volunteer services department. Once our volunteer services department um, connects with you, gives you a bit of an overview of Winnipeg Harvest, then they'll send you to our department, the food distribution department. We'll send you out first on a truck to um, 
be with someone that's experienced as a driver just so you get a feel for what's happening and you'll get to help that driver. Um, and then as you're comfortable, we'll partner you with um, someone that will drive with you just to make sure you're comfortable on the road. And then once you've been through those two stages and you feel comfortable and we've got all your paperwork signed, then we'll let you um, drive on your own. We t try to send all of our drivers with helpers um, just because there is a lot of lifting and um, just want to get you in and out as fast as possible. So if you know someone that wants to, that you'd like to bring along to um, drive with you, we welcome drivers to bring their own helpers as well. So. It's amazing working here. I love the people. Uh, the staff and the volunteers are all wonderful to work with and I've never been happier in a job. Like It just fits me really well here. I'm just going to be doing some jalapenos. So when we're doing the jalapenos, first of all I'm going to take off the top like that. And I'm going to slice down through there and that way I can take out this membrane here and all the seeds just so it's not as crazy oh, spicy. Oh, like a normal pepper, eh? Yeah. Jade Hebert is getting yet another helpful tip in making salsa, and it's all part of the kitchen training program at Winnipeg Harvest, led by Annalisa Shaw. Actually, what I'll do is I'll just get you to cut one more tomato. That would okay. be perfect. So I work here in the kitchen as a community kitchen facilitator, so that means I run this 10-week program, which has a lot of focus on practical skills, industry-level certification like WMIS and safe food handling, and then also just for students to get in here and get that practice time with me, serving our lunch so you make every day for free for or over 100 volunteers and staff. I'm growing peppers, cucumbers, tomatoes, and carrots in my garden at home. Oh, nice. That's awesome. I actually was just looking to get into a, a computer course, and someone had told me that Winnipeg Harvest has computer courses, so I applied online came to the orientation when I got here. They actually had a kitchen training program, a warehouse training program, and a reception training program. And I've always had a keen interest in cooking and being in the kitchen, so I took up the opportunity of uh, applying for the kitchen training program, and that's how I got into it. But if we're doing something like this that we're gonna serve the next day, uh, we can be a bit more flexible with the recipes. So that. One thing I always love seeing with our, each round of training programs is everyone kind of comes in here, they don't need to know each other yet, and then they start to become friends and also just make this amazing team of all of our volunteers working together to make lunch. And that was something that Jade did immediately. She really wanted to get to know everyone else, work really hard with them. Jade was also a really great communicator and that's so important in a kitchen, whether that's telling which shift she's scheduled for or just even walking behind someone and send hot pan, you know, to be careful, all that. She also just had really great knife skills. We have her over here cutting some uh, tomatoes for salsa and things like that. And she just was so eager and willing to learn. And that's just such a great thing to have in anyone, whether they've been at their job for five years, 10 years, or just starting out in that industry. It's been a great opportunity and more people should know about the program because it's very, very good. Winnipeg Harvest is well known for its fight against hunger, but now they are putting emphasis on their training programs that are offered to the public free of charge. The key thing is our training programs. A lot of people are surprised when they find out we have training here. So we have that for the kitchen training program, the warehouse, and customer service, and soon to be other new programs that you can find on our website. Another great thing is we offer healthy eating workshops here. So we taught people how to pickle. There's some pickles from uh, previous workshops, how to do salsa canning, as well as just how to make healthy salads and how to cook when you have diabetes and things like that to make healthy food. That's a, and these are all free. Not only are they free, you get to take food home at the end of it. And so these are really great programs that we can offer for people in our community. Great. Yeah, and then we can take some of this salsa to your grad tomorrow, and that's going to be awesome, and you guys can get all your salsa. Oh, I'm so excited about that tomorrow. Yeah. Jade has successfully completed her kitchen training and will be graduating very soon. She recently had her very first job interview, and she feels quite confident. I'm thinking that I might have a chance to get a job. Second. No, this is the most interesting Hugh crew. Still going live here. It's now the Hugh crew. Welcome. I uh, hope you had a chance to see the mayoral forum for hunger and poverty. And while one of the stars, I think all the candidates are stars, right? I think they're all stars. 
Yeah. You are talk. definitely Omar is probably the most passionate. <laughs> definitely okay. the loudest. Okay, okay so let's see. You can hold the mic like, down a little when you talk. Down. Why is this kind of weird loud? Definitely the, one of the most colorful. Thank you. All right, so we do have a couple of questions for you from the audience, too. So we're going to say, I think, what are your, what are you going to do so far for safety downtown? Excellent question. Simple is that my idea community policy do not spend taxpayers' money to hire more cops and more resources because each single person, if you can get hired for them, is cost taxpayers money. I am all about for saving taxes. Simple downtown issue is hire communities. Engage communities, that's a perfect word. Community policing is not a new thing, it's going to be happen in Winnipeg. It's all over the world. So especially in downtown, I'm a downtown boy. I can tell you I'm all the time in bars, <laughs> nightclubs, and even a rooftop. So I can tell you something, how downtown biggest problem is no doubt just for a safety, also for a parking too. People, they don't feel uh, come to the downtown. One of my ideas, I'm bringing a foreign investment from all over the world to Winnipeg. And the second thing, I'm going to be address your issue, uh, safety. Safety is the biggest concern. We just made, uh, I'm a proud member for, uh, uh, sorry, uh, we just made a new group, All Angels Guardian in Central Park. And thing is, this patrol, foot patrol, we're going to go into uh, along with the uh, downtown base to make sure it's a volunteer group. It's not cost taxpayers money. And also we're going to make a good relation for cops, police officers. I'm going to allow uh, police officers to stay there in specific downtown area so they can understand problems like meth and they can understand local issues of uh, violent crime. And how we can address them when you allocate properly police officers into the specific neighborhood so they can understand, live there and understand more problems. I'm going to pull a Mary Agnes. Community policing, that's the best I, idea. You know what, I just want to yeah. know, why are you running for mayor? Thank you. No, why are you running for mayor? Why, why, you want, why do you want to just... This question came up to me minimum, minimum uh, 200 times. <laughs> My economy and finance background. Because all I'm talking about financial statements. I'm all talking about numbers. I'm all talking about your taxpayers' money going to be spent where? Where I'm going to be saved? For my thing, no one is talking about ambulance service. Ambulance cost is pretty high in Canada. How we can reduce ambulance cost? People need one hour free parking, emergency, urgent care, cancer care. Without hiring more cops, how we can reduce crime? My idea 24-7 construction wow. in Winnipeg. Wow. It's going to be happen in Winnipeg 24-7 construction. Oh, you Amazing. Want well, no, okay. You know, like, the girls can talk. I'm going to grab Tim. Okay, go ahead. Those are great. Yes, yes, yes I know. Well, here, we've got, we've got Don here. We can so take you next, Mr. Wilson. Thank really you very much, Mr. Harley. Okay. We have, he, he gets we, the microphone. Yeah, we have a great yeah. question for you here. What do you plan to do about the meth epidemic in the city? Tiny homes. First of all, I'm going to build, make sure we have a hundred new beds, because that's what's missing. The detox, right now people are being turned away from detox, mm -hmm. and the only reason why people are being turned away from detox, we have an administration who have never stopped and looked at this problem to try and solve it, and this is a four-year problem that they know about, and they refuse to have dealt with it until I have that outburst on stage and people call me, whatever. But the fact is, meth crisis is here and we should have addressed it. 100 new beds, we're also gonna build tiny homes because- Where, which part of the city are you thinking? I am thinking just outside the city. With all due respect to the Bruce House Recovery Center, it's a $1,500 a month that people who are on meth goes in there and that's a three month window. For the meth crisis, you need at least 18 months to two years and everybody clap and applaud, and yeah, we have something. No, we don't. And that's the false of this whole thing, that people throw these things up to trick us. And I'm saying, no, let us be real, let us be honest. So I've identified properties just outside the city. Which part? North, south, east, west? You go 45 minutes, east, west, north, or south of Winnipeg, and you can find a lot of land. 
and, and Tiny Home, Homes for Heroes Foundation came to Winnipeg, asked the current administration for to help them build. All they wanted was to do was buy so you're a You're thinking like a tiny home community, is that you what you're bet, thinking? You betcha that will have that will allow them to have affordable long term. People who talk about long term and say three months, they're lying to you. They're not being honest. Well, thank, okay. you. thank you very much for your answer. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to move in Brian here. So yes, let's pass the mic to movie. Okay. There you are, Rana. <laughs> so we're going we're gonna to jump over to. Um, Hi there, Tracy. We're going to jump over to Brian. Uh, sorry, I'm going around in circles. I don't there mean to make you guys spin. So, Rana, do you have a question here for um, I do. Or for Doug, for Doug. Rather, Doug. Um, so Doug, mental health and homelessness are correlated. I think you guys uh, talked a little bit about uh, mental health and homelessness. So it's kind of a repeat question. Uh, any plans to address um, mental health issues um, as it affects homelessness and poverty? So what we have here that's very, very interesting is that we're <laughs> at a point now where we know that mental health has a actual measurable amount, measurable percentage of people that are homeless today. When we have mental health problems and they are on the street, that rapidly multiplies the problem. Now your question specifically is, how do we correlate the action? Is that right, Reina? Yes. How do we correlate? Okay, so yeah, so poverty, homelessness, and mental health. Essentially, Exactly. the so correlation the and how do they relate to each other. So, so the first thing on the plan is housing first, because we need to get them into a stable environment and fed and ready to accept what we can do as far as, as re reorganizing their life so it's a sustainable lifestyle and that's the key part of it all and that takes a large percentage of the people that are on the that are on the streets today mm -hmm. and we can do this but we have to work together so just as a follow-up question um, do you feel that um, if you were to be elected mayor you could take that challenge on and have it resolved within a four-year term uh, so I have a different position than all the other candidates, and that is that I am... figure that, which is why I want to ask you that. <laughs> I'm the former mayor of a, of a town that became a city, and we, we solve problems through growth. And the one important aspect here that I bring to the table is that I am a 24-7 guy. I'm here. I know that the other candidates have a lot of things going on in their lives, and, and this is where we are a little bit different. I've had my experience of being at the job and at the job doing it 24 7 not raising kids not having a business to run full full-time mayor thank you very much tracy thank you Raina. really good to see you guys okay so yeah you can give him the mic you you have a mic on you can give brian the mic you get the yeah you get to be the i get to ask you questions yeah. I've got some questions okay, for you. I've yeah. got one here just for you, actually. Yeah. Okay. You can go ahead. You don't need the mic. Oh, You've got oh I don't? Mic. Okay, perfect. Okay. Mr. Bowman brought up an excellent point at the beginning of the forum. Intentions and the will to see initiatives to completion are limited to resources and more crucially time. As mayor, what strategies do you have to budget your resources and time so we don't pass another mayoral term without crossing that red tape so we can truly improve the number of acute issues that the city of Winnipeg faces year in and year out? from a student here at the U of M. Sure, okay, well, I mean, firstly, uh, we have to balance our budget. I've balanced four budgets, and this last year, we uh, increased the size of government to the lowest level in the history of the city of Winnipeg. And so, um, within that budget, of course, you have to scrutinize the value for the dollars that you're you're spending on behalf of taxpayers. It's not, it's not, you know, City Hall's money, it's it's everybody else's money, so it's about scrutinizing those dollars. Did I answer the question? I was uh, just wanting to I make think sure. a little bit, and I think also the, the term red tape is in there, so how okay. can we sure. eliminate barriers to getting things done, not just for you and City yeah. Council, but for the everyday citizen who's looking to get goods and services from the city and yeah. eliminating those barriers? Well, customer service initiative is something that I've started. We've been working on everything from a permits, uh, uh, permits logistics desk in collaboration with the Winnipeg Chamber of Commerce the bylaw review. I've made further announcements during this campaign on how we can further reduce red tape um, and really just make sure that City Hall is is more open for business than it is even right now. Uh, we've got more businesses now than ever before in our history. We've been lowering the business tax, increasing the small business tax exemption th threshold, which means 50% of businesses don't pay any business tax now, uh, which means they can uh, support job creation and they can support growth in the community. So do you feel that efficiency has increased under your watch then as well? Um, 
It has uh, absolutely efficiency and also really focusing on innovation. Um, okay, not talk just to from me about a, that in terms yeah, of so, digital and moving things from analog to digital yeah. and getting us more online and being able to do things online, even from our phones, that we could interact with city services. Yeah, and I know you know that. Of course, <laughs> moving to our permits online, so yeah. we, of course that's new. Uh, we have a new Chief Innovation Officer, in Michael Laguerre, who's oh, a former absolutely. chair of the Winnipeg yes. Chamber of Commerce. Yes. We have a new full standing committee of council, that's the Innovation Committee. Um, we've got a, a new capital dashboard. We've moved up in the ranks from double digits to third in the country for Open Cities Index. We're now the third most open and transparent city in the country, and that's just been in the last four years that we've been able to move up those ranks. And Open Government. Uh, all of these initiatives are intended to make sure the information is accessible to entrepreneurs in machine-readable format so that they can commercialize all that data. We collect a lot of data on behalf of Winnipeggers, and I want to make sure we liberate that data, get it out, because it keeps uh, it keeps us accountable at City yeah. Hall, but also you can commercialize that data to do some good things in the community. Thanks to Tracy, who is actually <laughs> really the yeah. mayor. Really, the she's mayor. yeah, she's a great. <laughs> I'm not going to argue with you here. <laughs> yeah. Can I, can we just start yeah. just based on uh, just when yeah. you began. Sure. So when you all kind of started out, you 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 know alluded to the fact that there were most of the candidates were here, yeah. but there was a candidate that didn't make it, and um, I think a lot of people in the crowd kind of. Uh, enjoyed that or they clapped for that mostly because of the homelessness and poverty panel. Yeah. So um, how do you actually feel about that? I mean, and you, you know that you've been going through all these debates. Yeah. We've all kind of been through the ringer and gone through debate to forum to forum. And uh, I just, I guess my question is, it was such an important one. Do you feel that maybe it's not taken seriously or you know like how do you feel yeah. about that i mean poverty homelessness is such an important issue right uh, i mean there there were two candidates that weren't here i know one had declined and and i i, I was hoping she would come uh she's missed other other debates as well uh this was an approach and a political style that we saw in the last campaign gord steves uh didn't come to most of the debates um and and if there's a if there's a topic that uh, that, that is important. Uh, you know, one of the most important topics that a mayor has to face is how do you how do you look after those that, that need the most help in our community? And that's what we were talking about here tonight. And so it was a missed opportunity to present a, a vision and a positive platform that uh, this candidate missed. I also was looking forward to hearing how she's going to pay for $1.2 billion in promises because our debt ceiling is $145 million. So, you know, there is massive cuts and even one of her uh, supporters Ross Eady has acknowledged uh, that uh, she's going to be cutting services and so uh, I think everybody here would have liked the opportunity to be able to ask her what services are you going to cut are you going to hide them along with your campaign donors I mean let's let's be honest with people so let's talk a little bit as well about the transit and the sure. low income bus pass because obviously we're going to be getting some BRT yeah. so talk to me about how um, low income transit passes and BRT can help people in certain areas of the city be more more mobile and access jobs that are not necessarily available in their immediate communities. Well, part of uh, presenting a vision and, and governing for a city that's growing is how do you keep the city moving? And so, uh, yes, fixing the roads has been a really big priority for me. We've got the $976 million uh, plan that's costed and is unanimously supported by council. That's going to help transit as well because a lot of those buses drive on our roads. Uh, the transit improvements uh, that need to be made need to be made from a rider perspective. The transit system, there's good people working in transit, but the system is set up for transit. We need to turn it on its head. And so, um, you know, everything from BRT, improving the rider experience on the existing routes, looking at high frequency networks, mm -hmm. Um, the changes that are coming will, and if I'm elected, will represent, I think, the most significant changes in a generation to transit. I, I've been taking the 66 bus since I was a kid. It's the, yes. the bus that comes oh, in yeah. from Charleswood. Yeah. You know that bus, yeah. <laughs> and so it hasn't changed, but the city has changed a lot. It's changed a lot in the last four years. And so the routes don't necessarily make sense. Um, that means change, and change is difficult. And so if we're looking at high frequency networks, that means you're going to be reallocating resources, and it's it's going to take real leadership to do that. So to touch on those resources that we need for transit, is part of that a safety issue as well? Because like you, I mean, all of us here, I took the bus when I was a kid starting when I was 11 or 12. I don't know if I would send my child on a bus without me at this same age. So if safety is an issue, how can we um, mitigate that risk with either personnel on uh, buses that are sort of monitoring, or how do we do that and keep people safe at all well, times? 
first thing, great question. To because, encourage more uh, transit yeah, use. Yeah, unsafe or unaccessible transit is, is not going to be a successful transit. And so uh, it's also, we want to make sure our citizens are as safe as possible. And so um, one thing I, I can't do is I can't direct the operations of the police service. There's a provincial law that prohibits me from saying, well, I'm just going to put you know, I'm going to put police officers on buses. That's that's not how the legislation works. Right. And and so, but what we did do is we created a transit advisory committee so we can be working collaboratively with stakeholders, including ATU. Okay. Um, and we're now implementing uh, those recommendations, which I've embraced wholeheartedly. Every recommendation that came forward, from increased safety inspectors to uh, pilot projects for uh, for safety shields, um, to uh, a number of other measures. Uh, one of the things that we started well before the Transit Advisory Committee was looking at Wi-Fi on buses and the reason why that's important isn't because of Netflix that doesn't keep you yes. safe <laughs> the reason it's important is we want to be able to use the technology to live stream video For and I want to be able to make changes to the Pego system so it's it's more responsive to updates that people make in real time and so real improvements is why we're, we're testing those buses right now awesome. and safety thank you, thank you Mr. Ray. yeah thank you thanks right. guys have a great night okay thank you thanks thanks all right we can try well, and Grab Tim, to but to he's to actually, you know what? That uh, the yeah. gentleman yeah. that yeah. Tim's talking yeah. to, I don't know. Yeah, yes. I mean, he had some Former really important. Arby Russell, yeah. uh, well known in the community, who has yeah. really um, helped change the lives of. Yeah. No, I mean, his, been, well, Winnipeg's youth for sure in his neighborhood, and the success stories that he talks yeah. about are incredible. Yeah. And I think so that. Tim um, Come on, Tim. Good yeah. evening. Come on, don't, 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 right don't, over here. You're in the middle by three women, okay? Yeah, I know. Yeah. Watch me. Be no, that's don't be okay. polite. What is this? You want me to hold that's, this? That's your mic. All right. So, no. You so, have anyways, we were just having... Susie comes in here, too. Are you sure? Yeah, okay. come on in, too. Because, I mean, you were just talking right now to a gentleman, actually, and he had some really good points. He was a teacher, and he was talking, and uh, and you were chatting Mr. with Mr. McKinnon. Mr. McKinnon. Mr. McKinnon, yeah. yes. So, what was he talking about? What, what, was, he, what was his issue? Do you know? I, I do. I just want to get his permission before I talk about a conversation I had with him. But uh, okay. I, I will paraphrase yeah, you know, without paraphrase. breaching confidence. Yeah, Part sure. of the thing is, is that I, I'd like to make sure I get all sides before I engage yeah. on that conversation. Um, but this is a conversation. Yes, yes, we'll make this a conversation. Uh, his uh, suggestion that there should be more interaction with the teachers, the students, uh, so that we encourage more play, sport, arts, recreation, yeah. is proven. Yeah. It's, it's no longer an issue of opinion, yeah. it's proven. Yeah. Uh, I, I mentioned that a, a school lunch program yes. yeah. uh, increases the chances of a child, uh, I think it's by 30%. It's a ridiculously right. high number. Well, and Winnipeg Harvest is doing the bre uh, B2 breakfast, so I and, mean, and, we know and, that and too. All, like, it's, this is an investment. So what I end up with, I end up with a bunch of people who are pushing farther and farther out of town, or worse, are pushing out of the city altogether in the tax base. They wear and tear on our public safety and our roads and everything as they commute from their ring communities. Right. And then when I engage them, because I have a, an ability to engage people in my workplace, basically listen, nod, look pensive, not look right there, and then hopefully he'll go away. But what happens is I get their undivided attention on issues and they become candid with me with, well, why am I going to pay for that? Mm -hmm. And let's put a business model to child poverty, hunger, fear, pain, hate, all the beautiful things I deal with you every day. You were so right when you said that we either feed them now in school or we feed them in jail and later. And that's exactly And that's been it. proven time and time again with Breakfast Pubs of Canada and all kinds of um, So how do, we, how do we get them so they don't end up having to spend $20 for every dollar while they're in prison? And the question is, we can do as a municipality, one, breakfast program, two, allowing teachers to be empowered, not police figures and figures of authority and uniforms with guns in our school. No, I want the teacher. My wife's a teacher. She's like, we don't need that. Mm -hmm. The third is, well, we'll get rid of homework until grade 11, and the more significant point when it comes to uh, engaging kids and that they'll graduate is, is truancy. So is why is truancy, hang on, why is truancy yeah. so much higher in core area schools than it is, uh, say, out in Charleswood, where Brian Bowman grew up? And this is something I wouldn't know anything about, except I consistently deal with people who don't graduate from school, and you're 40% less likely to graduate if you have three absences a month. So to bring back to, you know, you round up the lunches and the truancy issue, is it more, I and mean, we've seen this in the States, in inner city schools and things like that, where they make the school basically like a second home. And it might not, they might not have an ideal home life to begin with, so what we can do is make that school a home place for them. It's the place where they belong, okay, I'm gonna where they stop become you right invested. There. 
Can you lower your chin down? No, no, come here. Lower your chin down. I'll give you my glasses. Those are my exact words. Yeah. Okay. So what do you want? I can nod and agree because that's exactly it. Right. That yeah. is exactly yeah. it. But you, but the like problem we have is that as soon as you engage the word home with a, a and, and for the most part, I think we're somewhere around three quarters of an indigenous population in the area I work, they're very sensitive to the idea of residency when it is attached to school. So it has to be clear. This is not your home. This is a place where you can come to stay to feel safe, but a safe place exactly. to play and study. Yeah. Exactly. So I'm and it's a place yeah. where parents can become involved as well and, and, that's and entire exactly family what systems, right? To start the Cheap conversation. EAs, mm -hmm. too. Like, this is win-win-win on many right. levels. But I do have a question. Okay. Yes. okay, and this came from the audience. So you mentioned making criminals pay for their time, yet today you say you understand that poverty leads to criminalization. How can you make poor people, i.e. criminals, pay for this? Okay, and I didn't say that today about okay. the impoverished people being an exemption. I had two crimes in mind, and I clarified that, but I didn't clarify it at the uh, at the time. Nobody asked me the question. Later on, Hal Anderson asked me that on the air, and I was very clear. The first one is impaired driving. Now, we got to remember how much we're paying every time we process an impaired driver. And they can afford a car, they can afford liquor, insurance, gas, well then they can afford the cost of the policing. That's a really big, important yeah. clarification. Yes. But I don't think many people knew that. I yeah. deal with poverty a dozen times a day. Sorry, I just I walked yeah. away there for a second, I apologize. Yeah, so continue on to, yeah, we're talk, so just talking about, you know, exactly. criminalization. What was the second crime? The second one are people that uh, take, basically, well actually no, not basically, directly. They're taking advantage of impoverished uh, women who are, basically, I would say, not raising their family. They're, they're trying to maintain their addiction through prostitution. And I think if you can afford a hotel room or if you can afford the communication in the vehicle and money to pay for sex, then you could pay for the money it costs to put you in prison. So you're talking about the Johns here? Yes. Johns. Okay. Why okay. are we letting Again, them two have very a break? important clarifications. They're very okay. clarifications. Yeah. I yeah. wouldn't say Johns because, but that's exactly what I mean. I don't know if that's yes. the right lingo. I don't know, but you should have been on my campaign team six months ago so I would get the right lingo because you're Only you stealing the words. Well, there I don't you do go. Twitter and they don't let me tackle we'll my Facebook. We'll talk about that later too. Yeah. 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 No, that's okay. That's no, okay. no, it's just that I'm I'm a fat old man that doesn't want to be on Twitter. Okay. But no, there's more to okay. it. You know what, like like everyone there's said, there's no shortage of great ideas here. And that's yeah. that's what we're here to discuss and that everyone gets out to vote no matter what. Yes, yeah. yeah. No, it's yeah, no, amazing. I, 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 um, I shouldn't belittle uh, modern communication, but I, I like the social networking and the things that you do. And Instagram. The hell was Instagram? I figured that out. But the reason I don't do that. We're going to take a selfie very soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, then that's fine to do now because I'm on the tail end of my career, but I've spent the better part of 25 years, well, actually my entire career, but 25 of it effectively, uh, dealing with people where secrecy is important. So having a public figure face and everything yeah. else so hasn't been. But if you get elected, you'd be yeah, very, be public, very public, Mr. So I'd be Instagram retiring from that portion of the job. I need to know, though. Yes. So Handle. if there's one thing that makes you stand out from the rest of the candidates tonight here, what would that be, Tim? Without being insulting to the other candidates? Come on. Okay, well, let's be <laughs> Speaking clear. from the heart. Speaking from the heart, what was I gonna, am the What's going to make one. One someone go into that ballot box next Wednesday and check off Tim Diaz. I'm not going to say I'm morally superior. I'm not going to say I'm intellectually superior. I'm not going to say that I have the high ground and can tell you what's great for the city. What I can tell you is that I know how to make the city more efficient and respective of your tax dollar. That means I know how to cut into the largest budgets. I know what the utilization rate means and I know how the system is gamed. I also know not to sit on expert reports that mention certain departments which are grossly overstaffed. And I could talk about all sorts of uh, you know, issues that have led to these historic, what people call sacred cows. But there are very effective ways to market the reduction of those costs because it's not in the benefit of the worker for them to be working, and I know this, to be working 24-hour days, to be piling all those hours up, all that overtime that mm -hmm. Brian Bowman likes to keep mentioning. Well, come on out and do the job, and you tell me if that's a smart way. You're going to end up leaving your family. You're going to end up being disconnected from people. And the question that never gets asked is, why do so many people who are in first line, first responders, paramedics, firefighters, police officers, move out of the city of Winnipeg? That's a tough question, because if we were going to go out to a restaurant afterwards, and one of us here was a health inspector and said, oh, no, no, we can't eat there, well, the same thing applies. Why are all these first responders not living here? And that's what I'd like to change. And I know how to change it. Okay. I will guarantee you, with maybe a slight exception for Doug Wilson, the rest of them are clueless on how to turn that around. And their concepts of efficiency, those are outside consultants looking at 
wall charts and maps and, and bar graphs. That's not how it's done. You go tell the people who, who are actually doing the job and they'll tell you how to do it more efficiently. Yeah. So I reverse engineer what's wrong with the city. I talk to the people that I know and I expand that once we're done with the biggest budget, which is the police budget, we'll go over to fire paramedic and then we'll get over to the other slices of that pie. But what people who are politicians constantly confuse because they don't have a business background is they confuse cost with value. Well, you're always going to find somebody to do it cheaper. That doesn't make it better. So all we're right. going to implement all yeah. the other parts of that. I'm going on again. Sorry about that. You know, well, we, we could work on that, you know? When you, yeah, work yep. on just, but you brought some really important points out. And that's, you know, we Thank just wanted to see. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, now, 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 is, now. What, what is this? <laughs> we're broadcasting uh, live. I'll let Tracy answer. Yeah, well, we are the Hugh crew. This is Rana. Hi. I'm Tracy. Susie. Good evening. And, uh, and I'm Bosley. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was almost kind of what we do. We just chat about things that are happening in and around the city. But tonight, we wanted to shed light on the candidates running for mayor and uh, get to know a little bit about there you. There were definitely some thoughtful answers for today, and I think yeah. that it's yeah. important that the voters... Sorry to talk voters. so fast. There's just so much to get out so there. That's great. That's great. I appreciate it. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'll take that. Thank you. Really Have a great that. night. Oh, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye. Yeah. That was oh my goodness! A lot of good information. Yeah, that was really fast. Fast and yeah. furious. Yeah, but you yeah. know what? I think everyone had um, really valuable points yeah. that um, in this in this type of topic right. they hadn't been brought up before. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it was worth noting as well that we have no left-leaning candidates in this election, yeah, which is no. almost a first mm. for a lot of years, yeah. I would think, if not the only time. Yeah. So the fact that we got these people who would be considered centrist and or center-right uh, right. to talk yeah. about these really important issues speaks a lot. It does. And the fact yeah. that the room is almost full also speaks a lot as well. Yeah, it was, it was pretty good. I know. I kind of too miss Jenny. I mean, I was. I really wish and I, I can her say her name. Yeah. 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 yeah, and you know, and she is in the running, and and well, I just from a female perspective, yeah, yeah. I, I just kind of. I know it was the mayoral mantle, I which know. I'm not a fan of. But at the same time, there was a great article about her in the CBC a couple days ago, talking yes. about her yeah. life experience with this very topic. Well, so I it was know. disappointing that we didn't get to see or that hear her perspective. perspective. Yeah, because I think yeah. she would have had some really insightful yeah. things to share with the audience today. Yeah, and what did you think? No, and I think the ones that were here. I mean, uh, we had a good group here today, and I think they did a great job. And the um, the moderate grade as well. Yeah, thank you. Mary. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, it's it's interesting. It's interesting to be on the other side of this and to yeah. kind of watch what is actually happening. Uh, you know, they 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 all have their uh, personalities that <laughs> surely shine throughout it well, all. Well, so that hey, would be really nice. yeah. no shortage I think of personality you should run. here. I think no. you should run. No, <laughs> my flat answer to that is no. <laughs> Um, but no, it was good and it was interesting, you know, uh, it's a very important issue. I kind of feel like there was that component of uh, indigenous urban use, like there was a whole component that was missing out of this entire thing. And, and that kind of yeah, which did made kind me of question, relate. well it made me question it, I don't even know if it's more of a relation, but it, it, you know, they sh there should have been maybe a direct that, question yeah, about that. Having said that, that, it was a pretty structured format, yeah. and uh, all things said though, I mean, it'll make you think, and you next think. week, when, October 24th, October that's 24th. it, go to ask for my birthday. Yeah. Yeah. polls are also open yeah. until I believe the weekend, so please yeah. check yeah. the city website And it's website so for that important to vote. Yes. You can sit there and make your own decision, but it's not going to count if yeah. you don't vote. Please Okay, and yes. then the last thing is, and stretch, do not be trolling the candidates. Okay, <laughs> like just because you support one person or the other, let's yeah. just keep the last keep it week clean, clean, clean it nice. and positive and about the city yeah. and, uh, you know, just keep it cool because, because it's the end, it's the end of yes. the, it's the end week and it always goes negative. And so be happy. But yeah. everyone here who's running is they a fan love. of Winnipeg. Yeah, yeah. they and love the city. everyone wants to make the city yes. successful. Yeah. So. And they have good hearts and they mean well, mm -hmm. so just uh, respect the fact that they put their name on the ballot and just peace be and good. Love. Peace and be love good. from the Hugh crew. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. That's a wrap. Yes, peace and, peace and love. Thanks so much. Okay, take care guys. The Hugh crew. Bye. Signing off.